buongiorno a tutti. Eh... Buongiorno Massimo, ti sentiamo, ti vediamo. Cristina, buongiorno Salve. Elsa, buongiorno a tutti i partecipanti e benvenuti a questo nuovo appuntamento, il nostro corso, seminario avanzato di filosofia della comunicazione. Personalmente sono molto felice di come sta procedendo questo seminario, credo che abbiamo ospitato degli interventi eh, di grande interesse e insieme con la collaborazione molto preziosa delle professoresse Elsa Soro e Cristina Voto e eh, del programma di conferenze che abbiamo eh, approntato insieme, stiamo procedendo nell'esplorazione di questo eh, tema per noi centrale che è il volto, ma in relazione alle sue declinazioni spazio-temporali, diverse culture del volto. Eh, abbiamo cominciato ieri a parlare di maschere, del senso della maschera come opposto al senso del velo. Abbiamo sottolineato il fatto che la maschera debba essere affrontata dal punto di vista semiotico in relazione alla sua fenomenologia, non tanto come oggetto eh, quanto eh, nel senso di apparato eh, che consente una serie di operazioni semiotiche. E le maschere sono oggi molto presenti nel tessuto visivo quotidiano, anche se nella forma di questo oggetto ancora di difficile di gestione eh, culturale che è la mascherina. E tuttavia, eh, come abbiamo sottolineato nella prima parte della lezione di ieri, le nostre società e si presentano a volto scoperto, si pensano a volto scoperto, si propagandano a volto scoperto. Eh, come vi ho ripetuto più volte, io vi parlo da, da Parigi e eh, nel eh, proibire eh, il velo integrale la Repubblica Francese ha voluto sottolineare proprio questo bastione eh, della presunta laicità dello spazio pubblico, il fatto che la Repubblica debba presentarsi a volto scoperto, che i cittadini debbano presentarsi a volto scoperto fra di loro e nei confronti dello spazio pubblico, nei confronti dello Stato. In realtà si tratta di ehm, una impostazione che ha eh, molti tratti della retorica, ci sono moltissime eccezioni alla eh, volontà di mantenere il volto dei cittadini e delle cittadine scoperto nello spazio pubblico e l'obiettivo nel caso della Repubblica eh, Francese era quello soprattutto di stigmatizzare eh, un eh, certo dispositivo, un certo eh, tipo di eh, velatura rispetto al volto, vale a dire quello di cui poi vi ha parlato la professoressa Mariglia Jardim ieri nell'ultima parte della, uh, del nostro appuntamento, della nostra lezione, e la velatura e il velo collegato alla uh, religione islamica, in particolare nelle sue forme più uh, eh, radicali e uh, fondamentaliste. E, um, in realtà, dal punto di vista eh, dello studio del significato della maschera, del senso della maschera, ehm, l'interesse degli studiosi nei confronti di questo oggetto è eh, molto antico, eppure eh, c'è forse da riflettere sul fatto che questo interesse sia stato proiettato eh, per molto tempo su culture altre, su culture lontane, su culture tecnologicamente e industrialmente meno avanzate di quelle occidentali, ehm, come se eh, questo oggetto, questo dispositivo, ma anche la fenomenologia che ne decorre, fossero stati ehm, espulsi dalla sfera visiva occidentale e proiettati verso un altrove. No, sappiamo che ci sono degli eventi particolari nella cultura europea come il carnevale in cui eh, risorve un certo uso specifico della maschera, ma la maschera in quanto dispositivo rituale eh, ricorrente, quasi quotidiano, eh, era diventato oggetto, per così dire, esotico, comunque oggetto di studio mh, di una antropologia piuttosto classica, non l'antropologia della quotidianità occidentale, la Marcogè, ma l'antropologia 
ehm, eh, più tradizionale, quella che si spingeva verso luoghi remoti, eh, non toccati dalla rivoluzione industriale per studiarne le culture, gli assetti sociali. E, tuttavia c'è eh, eh, uno spartiacque eh, nel, nello studio della maschera, di cui poi ho parlato in un articolo che ho messo tra i materiali eh, di questo corso, mh, la pubblicazione nel 1975 eh, di un'opera eh, molto eh, approfondita di eh, Claude lévi eh, sul senso delle maschere, eh, intitolato la, la Voix des Masques, la Via delle Maschere, un'opera in due volumi con delle bellissime illustrazioni, una cosa molto interessante di, del fatto di Ehm, eh, studiare eh, le maschere e che visivamente sono spettacolari no? i libri sulle maschere, gli articoli sulle maschere sono bellissimi c'è un po' di rumore di fondo oggi perché c'è una specie di fuga da, da Parigi ieri è stato decretato un nuovo confinamento nella, nella capitale francese quindi adesso tutti i parigini qui sotto, il mio, sotto la mia finestra fuggono disperatamente da, da Parigi, quindi se sentite le macchine è questo, è, è in corso la fuga da Parigi, ma ovviamente noi non fuggiamo, rimaniamo qui, guardate quanti libri ci sono da leggere, quindi a voglia possiamo resistere a danni di confinamento. E, allora, in questo, in questo doppio, in, questo, in questa opera, in due volumi, intitolata La Voix des Masques, eh, Claude Lévi-Strauss si interessa in particolare ad alcune maschere, no? c'è una varietà culturale straordinaria nel tempo, nello spazio, nell'uso, nel significato delle maschere, e ehm, si occupa in particolare eh, delle maschere utilizzate da popolazioni che eh, all'epoca, cioè negli anni 70, ancora vivevano, in parte vivono, ehm, in quella bellissima zona del, del Cale che vi consiglio di visitare se un giorno riusciremo a, a riprendere i nostri viaggi, no? eh, nel... Eh, zona denominata British Columbia, no? c'è questa università che pure vi consiglio, University of British Columbia, Vancouver, una città bellissima, e, e allora Claude Ristros vi si reca e eh, raccoglie mh, delle testimonianze visive, raccoglie anche molte, molte maschere, e, però l'approccio di Claude Ristros è molto particolare perché e, in effetti, come dicevo, segna uno spartiacque, nel senso che non si limita più a raccogliere i racconti, le descrizioni, ehm, eh, le esternazioni della comunità locale rispetto alle maschere e nemmeno a un approccio di tipo storico oppure legato all'antropologia del rito, alla filosofia delle religioni. E, no, l'approccio è squisitamente strutturale, anzi potremmo dire mh, squisitamente semiotico, no? quelli di voi che hanno studiato semiotica si ricorderanno della distinzione tra <coughs> livello plastico e livello figurativo, allora, per quelli di voi che non hanno studiato semiotica diciamo che molto brevemente quando eh, la semiotica strutturale, in particolare la semiotica generativa, quindi Algir Das, Julien Grimas e la sua scuola eh, cominciano a occuparsi di semiotica delle immagini, del senso delle immagini, eh, si scontrano poi con un eh, problema che è un problema classico della semiotica che è il senso delle immagini non figurative. No? Qual è il senso di immagini che non rappresentano degli oggetti riconoscibili, degli oggetti lessicalizzabili? Allora si sviluppa questa distinzione che troviamo in Grimas, ma anche in altri studiosi, no? Jean-Marie Floch, tutta la semiotica visiva strutturale generativa, tra livello plastico e livello figurativo. È come se riconoscessimo, riconoscessimo due livelli nelle immagini, eh, un primo livello è quello che troviamo nelle immagini figurative, che ci permette di riconoscere in una foto un volto, no? Un volto o che vi permette per esempio di riconoscere in questo quadratino uh, di, uh, dove siamo? Zoom, no, Webex, di Webex, uh, un volto, una cravatta, una giacca, cioè degli oggetti che, che fanno parte della configurazione visiva del mondo e che voi siete in grado di lessicalizzare, che significa semplicemente siete in grado di attribuire dei nomi tratti dal lessico della lingua naturale a questi oggetti, no? Però 
Eh, vedete, la mia cravatta eh, non ha una struttura figurativa, sì, ma ha una struttura figurativa nel senso che la riconoscete come cravatta, però ha soprattutto una struttura plastica, no? che è data dal fatto che prevede questa alternanza di due colori, no? eh, dorato e marrone, ehm, che prevede una certa forma di questa alternanza, sono delle fasce orizzontali regolari, che prevede una topologia, no? sono uh, allineate in maniera regolare lungo tutto l'asse verticale. Queste sono in effetti le tre dimensioni della, uh, del livello plastico delle immagini, cioè i colori, le forme e la disposizione, no? a livello cromatico, a livello idetico, a livello topologico. E la cosa interessante, mh, scoperta, mh, promossa, diciamo, uno sguardo promosso dalla semiotica generativa, è che questa, questo livello plastico si può poi eh, studiare non soltanto nelle immagini non figurative, ma anche nelle immagini figurative, cioè anche quando riconoscete degli oggetti in un dipinto, in una fotografia, in un film, eh, potete comunque interessarvi alla struttura plastica che soggiace alle figure e che permette a queste figure poi di formarsi, no? i cosiddetti formanti plastici. Allora, questo in maniera molto rapida, in maniera molto concisa. Allora, Claude Levi-Strauss, quando studia le maschere, cerca di studiarne proprio la struttura plastica, e, perché in questa sua straordinaria immaginazione del senso del mondo, no? avrete letto forse Claude Levi-Strauss, il suo modo rivoluzionario di leggere i miti, di leggere il senso dei miti, no? che è un modo eh, profondamente, radicalmente, visceralmente strutturale, no? influenzato da, dalla linguistica strutturale di Ferdinand de Saussure. E cioè l'ipotesi di Claude Ristos, come in altri ambiti studiati da questo straordinario protagonista dell'antropologia del Novecento, è che il significato delle maschere vada eh, cercato nella loro struttura plastica, ma, come vi dicevo anche durante le lezioni precedenti, vada investigato nella dialettica fra tipi di maschere. No? Quindi, ancora una volta, quando vedo una maschera e non mi interesso tanto a quello che rappresenta, dal punto di vista figurativo, quello che vi posso riconoscere, perché quello che riconosco è sempre una maschera, no? cioè una specie di simulacro parziale del volto, ma mi interessa invece la sua struttura plastica, cioè alle forme, ai colori, alle disposizioni eh, che posso scorgere in questa maschera stessa. E poi comincio a costruire delle opposizioni, no? costruire delle opposizioni, mettere in relazione ciò che è differente per un verso, ma che per altro verso eh, condivide dei tratti, è un'operazione eh, squisitamente eh, semiotica, un'operazione che vi invito anche ad effettuare mm, nelle vostre tesine, non tanto perché dobbiate diventare dei semiotici, eh, qualcuno di voi potrà continuare a coltivare altre discipline, ma perché eh, è interessante, credo anche divertente, eh, anche per lo spazio e il tempo di un esercizio, eh, aderire a questa modalità di... Eh, eh, analisi del mondo, no? che vede nel mondo sempre delle differenze, che vede nel mondo sempre delle relazioni, che non si interessa tanto agli elementi singoli eh, presi in termini assoluti, ma che invece continuamente crea delle reti, crea delle relazioni. Allora, Claude Levi Strauss eh, studia le maschere eh, dette Swai Wei del gruppo Salish della Colombia occidentale, della British Columbia, e le maschere XOXOE del gruppo Quacutul, che forse avete diciamo, incontrato anche nei vostri studi se avete studiato antropologia, eh, ricorderete sicuramente gli studi di, di Boas, un padre dell'antropologia dell americana rispetto a questo gruppo, e ehm, dall'altra parte invece le maschere Zonokwa, eh, sempre utilizzate da questo gruppo qua a Qtul. Allora, quello che interessa eh, di questo volume, di questa quest opera in due volumi, la Guade Mask, eh, non sono tanto le conclusioni, perché le conclusioni possono essere poi riviste, eh, diciamo dipendono anche un po' dal corpus che è stato raccolto da Claude Levi-Strauss, 
Quello che interessa è invece l'approccio, cioè il fatto che la maschera venga eh, letta da Claude Lévi-Strauss eh, con questo gesto che è molto innovativo come dispositivo strutturale, no? è qualcosa che mi permette di esprimere un senso in relazione al volto sottostante, eh, quindi eh, costituendo un primo scarto rispetto al volto, rispetto alla faccia, eh, ciò che la maschera copre ma rispetto al quale esprime un senso, ma anche in relazione ad altre maschere, quindi ci sono due sistemi relazionali, un primo sistema relazionale locale, la maschera rispetto al volto, e eh, un altro sistema relazionale più generale che è la maschera rispetto ad altre maschere. No? Non è nulla di mh, trascendentale, mh, se pensate al, al modo in cui significano gli abiti, per esempio significano molto spesso nello stesso modo, cioè gli abiti che io indosso significano rispetto al corpo, che coprono o rivelano, che mettono in risalto, che dissimulano e che comunque modificano visualmente, eh, ma significano anche in relazione sostanzialmente a tutti gli altri abiti che io non indosso. No? E trovate i due assi fondamentali della mh, significazione secondo la linguistica strutturale di Ferdinand de Saussure, cioè il sintagma e il paradigma il sintagma della maschera sul volto, il paradigma della maschera rispetto a tutte le altre maschere che vengono escluse, no? le maschere che non vengono portate, che però in questa loro negatività designano, determinano anche il senso della maschera indossata. Allora, in questo stesso anno, nel 1975, compare anche un altro studio in una rivista, eh, beh, adesso insomma, mi fa un po', come dire, mi imbarazza un po', mi fa un po' arrossire dire che questa rivista è molto importante, è una rivista che si chiama Semiotica, eh, quando ero un giovane studente appunto mi si parlava, uno dei miei maestri, Omar Calabrese, che era un professore dell'Università di Siena, purtroppo scomparso, mi parlava di questa rivista eh, e ne parlava in termini mitici, no? utopici, perché era comunque la prima rivista... Eh, internazionale di semiotica, comunque la più importante, fondata nel 69 da Umberto Eco, da Sibioc, eh, dove si pubblica tutta la semiotica, diciamo, di punta a livello internazionale. E, poi, insomma, il caso ha voluto che io diventassi il, il, il direttore di questa rivista, quindi adesso la vedo con uno sguardo diverso, diciamo, mi sembrava una... una una rivista mitica quando avevo più o meno l'età degli studenti della magistrale di oggi e poi adesso invece che la, la devo pubblicare io, mi sembra un'altra cosa, comunque è cambiata la prospettiva. Comunque nel 1975 questo studioso eh, Boris Ogibenin che faceva parte della scuola di, di Tartu e Mosca, che conoscerete insomma perché è una delle grandi scuole della, della semiotica, ne abbiamo un rappresentante anche a Torino, il professor Remo Gramigna, che insegna anche la semiotica alla, alla triennale, viene appunto da quella scuola di, di Tartu. E, mm. Allora, questo studioso Oki Benin pubblica un articolo eh, sul, sulle maschere, e, e nel quale adotta, e lo pubblica appunto su semiotica, e giustamente lo pubblica su semiotica, su questa rivista, perché adotta un uh, approccio uh, chiaramente strutturalista ma chiaramente anche semiotico no? infatti vi leggo una citazione da questo scritto poi lo, la, la ritrovate, la ritroverete questa citazione nel pdf di un articolo che ho già inserito nei materiali del, del corso se volete andate, andate a leggere non è un obbligo ma insomma è un, è un invito e scrive questo studioso uh, Oggi Bienin che scrive in inglese Is it possible to make typological generalizations of a socio-anthropological nature from which one could predict if there exist or existed societies without a subculture of masks? In which types of society did masks penetrate as an absolutely essential part of the art of representation and portrayal? Finally, is it possible to find a relationship between the types of cultures and the types of masks used in them? E questa è la frase che sottolineo di più, eh, una, una, una domanda che poi la semiotica ha cominciato a porsi in maniera sistematica rispetto alle maschere, cioè, finally, is it possible to find 
a relationship between the types of cultures and the types of masks used in them. No? E, infine, è possibile trovare una relazione tra i tipi di culture e i tipi di maschere che vi sono utilizzate. E, anche questo è un approccio molto semiotico. No? E noi procediamo sempre su due livelli. Qui cioè, da un lato ci occupiamo di semiotica dal volto, dall'altro io cerco di darvi anche delle dritte su come impostare il vostro lavoro e anche su come eh, organizzare il vostro studio se vorrete continuare a lavorare in questo ambito per me oramai esistenziale che è quello della semiotica. E rispetto a, a degli ambiti molto complessi, per esempio l'ambito di un'intera cultura o, o l'ambito ancora più complesso della comparazione fra culture, la semiotica si trova in difficoltà spesso nel descrivere ehm, una cultura nella sua singolarità, perché questa operazione è già di per sé eh, molto dubbia, mh, è inevitabilmente un'operazione assolutizzante. No? Che cos'è la cultura italiana, la cultura pugliese, la cultura piemontese? No? Eh, si rischia di scadere costantemente nello stereotipo. Allora l'approccio invece della semiotica, in particolare della semiotica delle culture, tra parentesi la sem semiotica della cultura era un insegnamento che io avevo alla magistrale, poi l'ho spostato, spostato alla triennale e adesso l'ho eh, affidato a una professoressa molto, molto brava che è Anna Maria Fantauzzi, perché proprio a seguito di questo progetto ieri diciamo che insegno meno, mi dedico di più alla, alla ricerca, però un punto fondamentale della semiotica delle culture di Lotman è che ehm, si procede per tipologie. La tipologia è eh, uno degli strumenti fondamentali della semiotica delle culture. E, noi non abbiamo l'ambizione, non abbiamo in quanto semiotici della cultura a conoscere le culture eh, isolatamente, a conoscerle in assoluto. A studiare e descrivere per esempio quale sia la cultura italiana della maschera. Noi invece eh, andiamo eh, a eh, compiere un'operazione che è molto più fattibile dal punto di vista della semiotica, vale a dire quella <ride> salute eh, immaginate se fossimo in presenza no? Ah, fuga generale <ride> invece no, state tranquilli Um, e, e um, l'operazione che consiste nel creare una tipologia cioè um, per me è forse difficile dire che cosa significa la maschera nella cultura italiana contemporanea però posso creare di nuovo delle opposizioni, delle tensioni, dei sistemi, delle dialettiche tra il senso della maschera nella cultura diciamo così, italiana contemporanea, e il senso della maschera nella cultura cinese contemporanea. Allora, eh, questa operazione eh, mi consente ancora una volta di procedere per tratti distintivi, per tratti significativi, eh, cioè eh, stabilire, per esempio, attraverso un'osservazione sistematica delle due realtà, quale tipo di maschera viene utilizzata soprattutto nell'Italia contemporanea, quale tipo di maschera viene utilizzata invece nella cultura cinese contemporanea. E io sono sicuro che se noi facessimo questo esercizio, se, se noi compiessimo questo esercizio, eh, troveremmo eh, dei, delle configurazioni, troveremmo dei clusters, cioè ci renderemmo conto che in alcune situazioni cronotopiche, ehm, per esempio l'ora dell'aperitivo lungo il Canal Saint Martin qui a Parigi, oppure eh, l'ora dell'aperitivo ehm, lungo la Senna sempre qui a Parigi, in situazione pandemica. Allora ci renderemmo conto forse che osservando in maniera sistematica Uh, la struttura plastica delle mascherine portate dagli individui lungo il canale Saint Martin, lungo la Senna, e, um, e arriveremo alla conclusione che c'è già una tipologia festiva di mascherina, cioè c'è un tipo di mascherina che gli individui tendono ad indossare nel momento in cui 
sono in situazioni di tipo ludico, quando devono incontrare degli amici, quando devono ehm, partecipare, sia pure secondo più o meno le norme vigenti a degli assembramenti pubblici, e quando devono incontrare qualcuno che già conoscono, no? e forse in questi casi emerge eh, una esigenza di estetizzazione della mascherina, di accentuazione della sua singolarità. No? Eh, io stesso, per esempio, ho delle orrende mascherine cinesi, eh, che però sono quelle ultra, diciamo, sicillanti, che mi creano no, questi solchi lungo il viso, come una specie di sorriso, eh, che, che abbiamo visto in tutte le foto, diciamo, eroiche di questo personale eh, del, degli ospedali o delle, delle case di riposo. E, e poi però come tutti ne ho anche delle altre che sono un po' più festive, che però probabilmente sono anche un po' più inutili, ma che vengono indossate quando, non so, devo incontrare qualcuno che già conosco, di cui più o meno mi fido, eccetera, eccetera. Quindi c'è una tipologia, che in questo caso individuale, psicologica, eccetera, però se la moltiplicate su uno scenario vasto di big data, cioè se noi potessimo... Ecco, ah sì sì, questo è anche interessante, cosa ci dice la dottoressa? Kerchi, anche Matteo Salvini sceglie mascherine ad hoc in base agli eventi pubblici a cui deve partecipare. Sì, sì, certo, ma poi se, se si è eh, dei personaggi pubblici, quindi che continuano ad essere, il cui volto continua a essere rappresentato nonostante la mascherina, eh, lì eh, la mascherina diventa anche un luogo di, eh, diciamo, eh, comunicazione di un messaggio particolare, di una particolare eh, retorica. Sappiate che grazie a un'iniziativa del dottor... Marco Viola, che ha già presentato la sua conferenza in questo seminario, anche il nostro gruppo di ricerca, cioè Facets, ha delle particolari mascherine. Cioè abbiamo delle mascherine con logo, che però diciamo, fanno, fanno un po' specie, perché da, da un lato fa un po' sorridere questa cosa che io, la professoressa Voto, la professoressa Soro, eh, il eh, <ride> mascherina is the new felpa, sì, eh, sì è vero. Eh, però però c'è qualcosa di diverso, cioè è vero che la mascherina is the new felpa, ma contemporaneamente eh, capi capirete che questo, eh, questa traslazione, questo spostamento del peso retorico dal petto, no? dove solitamente comparivano eh, delle immagini o dei messaggi verbali eh, associati a questa o quella felpa al volto, eh, in un certo senso potenzia il messaggio comunicato. Da un altro punto di vista però lo depotenzia perché, come vi dicevo a proposito di queste mascherine che ci sono nel nostro gruppo, eh, sì, ci fa un po' sorridere che noi possiamo andare in giro con queste mascherine che, ha, che hanno il colore eh, scelto per il nostro gruppo di ricerca, che è una specie di blu turchese, no? quello del logo di Facets, e poi con, lo con il logo di Facets, che è un logo molto carino, che è stato eh, disegnato da un designer milanese, che diciamo, dispone le lettere della dell'acronimo Facets, eh, come se dovessero comporre un, uh, un volto. Allora, da un lato ci fa sorridere, dall'altro lato però eh, un po' risulta inquietante. Perché? Perché, diciamo, eh, un conto eh, è portare un logo eh, sul petto, eh, ci siamo abituati a questa operazione, no? Il fatto che, non so, le nostre calze rechino un logo, oppure che... Uh, le nostre camicie rechino un logo, no? Io sono un po' figlio della, di, di, della generazione Naomi Klein, no? questo libro molto molto diffuso, non so se l'avete letto perché è ormai un, un classico, no logo, quindi diciamo <ride> ho poi eliminato un po' tutti i loghi, soprattutto nel mio abbigliamento personale, però eh, ci sono quelli che poi comprano no? i vestiti con i loghi e li scuciano. Um, però pensate a quanto è um, dirompente, ma forse anche violenta, l'operazione di apporre un logo uh, al volto di una persona, cioè il, il luogo nel quale la ideologia semiotica vigente concentra in maniera um, uh, assolutamente radicale il senso della singolarità. Eh, abbiamo forse già parlato, vi ho già parlato, vi hanno parlato, vi parleranno di alcuni tabù che riguardano il volto, mh, diciamo che nonostante eh, risulti sempre più comune, perché questo tabù viene sfidato sempre di più, però il tatuaggio sul volto per esempio risulta ancora qualcosa di molto eh, raro. 
che ehm, si situa ancora ai margini della pratica diciamo, del tatuaggio e anche da parte dei stessi professionisti. No? Sapete, ci sono molti tatuatori che fra diciamo, le regole professionali proprie hanno anche quella di non tatuare il, il volto. E, quindi immaginate che cosa vuol dire associare uh, a, a un volto e poi in questo caso non un tatuaggio ma una mascherina uh, un messaggio che può essere un messaggio politico uh, cioè farsi vedere per esempio con una mascherina che uh, rappresenta una bandiera no? rappresenta la bandiera italiana, rappresenta la bandiera dell'Unione Europea eh, è qualcosa che viene fatto soltanto da esponenti politici che comunque appartengono a determinate ideologie, no? che vogliono sancire molto, in maniera molto radicale una certa appartenenza nazionale, una certa appartenenza ideologica. Comunque diciamo un gesto sempre molto eh, complicato, quello di associare un messaggio a una mascherina. Eh, però ecco, eh, per ritornare a quanto dicevo prima, ritroveremmo comunque se potessimo eh, fare quello che purtroppo non possiamo fare perché le regole vigenti della ricerca nell'Unione Europea eh, non ci consentono di farlo, cioè se potessimo raccogliere eh, dei dati massivi, eh, per esempio studiando le immagini facciali riprese dalle telecamere di sorveglianza in una città come Parigi, e poi attraverso l'intelligenza artificiale creare delle eh, tipologie di mascherine indossate dal, dall'individuo in uno spazio pubblico, eh, beh, io credo, diciamo, questa operazione per problemi di privacy, eccetera, probabilmente non potremo mai farla, no? anche se ci piacerebbe molto, la professoressa Soro ci ha, ci ha parlato in altre occasioni, di ehm, diciamo, questi tentativi di geolocalizzazione del, dello studio del volto rispetto alla città, no? è un po' una frontiera della ricerca rispetto, rispetto al volto, se potessimo farlo eh, ci accorgeremmo che ci sono dei cluster, ci sono dei cluster di età, ci sono dei cluster per luogo, ci sono dei cluster per orario, eh, per occasione sociale, Alcuni di questi cluster, alcune di queste configurazioni, di raggruppamenti, eh, possiamo già immaginarli. Cioè si può immaginare un uso festivo della mascherina, un uso prettamente sanitario, un uso svogliato, eccetera, eccetera. Ehm, questo per eh, sottolineare il fatto che, ancora una volta, quello che ci interessa non è di fermare un individuo per strada, no? questa signora che sta passando adesso sotto la mia finestra, che ha una mascherina e studiarla come individuo per determinare che cosa significa la mascherina di questa signora, perché i risultati di questo tipo di indagine sarebbero molto soggettivi. No? Quello che ci interessa invece è determinare se vi siano delle eh, tipologie di maschera e soprattutto tipologie di senso eh, associato a, a, queste, a queste maschere. Quindi la costruzione di tipologie deve essere sui due piani, il piano dell'espressione e il piano del contenuto. Noi siamo interessati a capire se ci sono delle regolarità, delle distribuzioni rispetto alla sintassi della maschera, della mascherina, eh, però siamo interessati forse ancora di più a capire se eh, vi siano delle correlazioni tra queste configurazioni sintattiche, tra il tipo di mascherine che vengono portate dalle persone, da come vengono portate, e il senso che invece queste mascherine da un lato progettano e dall'altro esprimono. No? Ricorderete, eh, sempre breve parentesi di semiotica generale, ma insomma quelli di voi che hanno studiato semiotica ricorderanno la distinzione ripresa molte volte da Umberto Eco tra intensio operi, intensio operis, intensio lectoris, intensio octoris, cioè un conto è quello che io voglio esprimere attraverso un atto comunicativo, eh, altra cosa è ciò che viene recepito come senso di questo atto. No? All'inizio della pandemia, eh, per esempio, eh, i cittadini di origine cinese o che erano collegati in qualche modo culturalmente e socialmente alla Cina, me compreso, no? perché come sapete io normalmente insegno due mesi all'anno presso l'Università di, di Shanghai, e, e quindi mh, ho vissuto diciamo, l'inizio della pandemia molto prima che arrivasse in Italia, quindi ero cosciente diciamo, della gravità della situazione 
già verso la fine di dicembre 2019, no? invece in Italia ci sono voluti ancora due mesi per prendere un po' contezza della gravità della cosa, però io stesso e mh, molti cittadini cinesi residenti in Italia eh, portavamo eh, già la mascherina eh, negli spazi pubblici, eh, nei ristoranti, eccetera, eccetera. E, e però il senso eh, progettato rispetto a questo dispositivo era radicalmente diverso rispetto al senso percepito, cioè eh, molti cittadini cinesi residenti a Prato, in Italia, eccetera, portavano la mascherina molto prima che eh, la portassero poi tutti gli altri, tutte le altre, eh, anche nel senso di comunicare il fatto di essere dei cittadini responsabili, no? di non essere una fonte di contagio. E però molto spesso queste stesse mascherine venivano interpretate in modo radicalmente diverso. Cioè l'interpretazione, il progetto comunicativo è mi metto la mascherina e ti mostro che sono un bravo cittadino, non contagerò nessuno. E invece il contenuto comunicativo recepito era beh, allora tu hai la mascherina quindi sei malato, via, lontano, no? lontano, fuori dai confini nazionali. Vedete che, che differenza, che decodifica completamente aberrante, come la chiamavano eh, Paolo Fabri e Umberto Eco. E, quindi, diciamo, ci accorgeremmo che ci sono queste tipologie e rispetto a queste tipologie eh, attirava l'attenzione questo primo studio semiotico del, delle maschere eh, pubblicato nel 1975 da ehm, Oggy Benin. Um, C'è un altro studio sempre del 1975 di cui ho parlato in maniera più approfondita anche in un seminario di lettura che noi abbiamo nel nostro gruppo Facets eh, periodicamente, un uh, saggio pubblicato da Alfred Gell che è stato un grande antropologo eh, diciamo che ha rivoluzionato i metodi dell'antropologia contemporanea soprattutto come studioso di ciò che nella mh, filosofia dell'azione si chiama agency, cioè la gentilità, la capacità di agire nel mondo, no? eh, magistrare lo studio di, di Gell sulla agentilità delle opere d'arte. No? L'intuizione di Gell è stata quella di studiare per esempio le opere d'arte come se si trattasse degli agenti, agenti eh, antropomorfi in grado di esercitare un'influenza, un'azione nel tessuto sociale, culturale, circostante, quindi un antropologo fortemente innovativo. E, però ehm, nel 1975 Gell eh, pubblicava una monografia che era sostanzialmente uno studio derivato dalla sua eh, field experience, no? la sua esperienza di campo. Eh, ci sono delle differenze tra semiotici ed antropologi. Eh, vi ho parlato già delle differenze tra semiotici e filosofi. No? I semiotici si interessano dei loro testi i filosofi si interessano ai loro pensieri, eh, però ci sono anche delle differenze tra semiotici e antropologi. No? La differenza fondamentale tra il semiotico e l'antropologo è che eh, l'antropologo viaggia di più, cioè l'antropologo normalmente diciamo, ha questa idea che lo studio debba essere mh, correlato anche ad un'esperienza dell'altrove, no? questo poi si è un po' modificato per l'antropologia della quotidianità, l'antropologia urbana, Marco G, l'antropologo del metro, però c'è questa idea che lo spostamento eh, nello spazio sia fondamentale, il vedere di persone no? sia ancora fondamentale per costruire il sapere antropologico. Allora, Gell nel 75 pubblica questa monografia intitolata Metamorphosis of the Cassowaries, who made a society, language and ritual. Non ci interessa tanto, diciamo, il contenuto generale, è una... Uh, uno studio magistrale che cerca di decodificare il senso dei rituali nella società umeda della Papua Nuova in Guinea, eh, però c'è una citazione in particolare eh, in questo studio che vorrei riportarvi, in questo nostro diciamo, avanzare progressivo nella storia della semiotica delle maschere, eh, Gell, Gell eh, afferma in questa monografia, in a sense, all the masks do is take up and elaborate certain expressive means which are implicit in everyday usage. The same is true, for instance, of the expressive use of treatments of the penis in ritual, where once again the usages of everyday life are taken up and modified in various ways in order to make symbolic statements. Allora, un altro passo avanti, molto importante, 
eh, nella uh, uh, semiotica, scusate, io sono un no, no, non nativo digitale, no? per me la chat è sempre un, un mondo misterioso nel quale mi rendo conto che succedono delle cose, no? e cioè, vedo che ci sono quei miei collaboratori che sono di una generazione successiva che hanno questa capacità bioculare no? di avere un occhio su tutto, e quindi... però adesso ritorno sui commenti in chat. Però volevo dirvi, un altro passo avanti in questa, diciamo, nostra eh, storia, breve storia della semiotica della maschera, eh, la semiotica intesa come disciplina, studio semiotico della maschera, eh, eh, consiste proprio in questa tappa in cui Gell si rende conto che la maschera in realtà non è qualcosa che si sovrappone al volto. Questa è una nozione molto semplicistica della fenomenologia della maschera, eh, allora, questo passaggio è interessante da un lato perché ehm, eh, sottolinea il fatto che la maschera deve essere studiata non tanto quanto oggetto quanto come fenomenologia, cioè non ci interessa tanto la maschera in sé quanto quello che la maschera fa rispetto al volto. No? Um, però l'altro punto fondamentale è che supera eh, questo passaggio, questo brano, questa citazione, supera l'idea che la maschera sia sovrapposta al volto. Sì, fisicamente può essere sovrapposta al volto, però di fatto, dal punto di vista semiotico, anche dal punto di vista cognitivo, la maschera interagisce con i tratti del volto, interagisce con l'uso del volto, interagisce con l'uso quotidiano del volto. Cioè eh, il senso della maschera emerge dal fatto che eh, tende a riscrivere un uso quotidiano del volto ehm, dal quale però non prescinde affatto. No? Ciò che Gell scopre è che queste maschere utilizzate eh, dalla società Umeda sono maschere che in realtà si basano sul modo in cui i volti vengono utilizzati quotidianamente. No? Quindi è necessario comprendere l'uso del volto eh, in società per comprendere l'uso della maschera e viceversa, studiare la maschera è in realtà un modo per conoscere meglio il volto. No? Allora, ritorno un attimo su, sui commenti. La dottoressa Priscilla Cardoso Pasqua scrive Lewis Hamilton quando è vietato, di, quando gli si vieta di manifestare con la maglia Black Lives Matter, usa la mascherina con lo stesso messaggio. Sì, in effetti eh, non, non mi ricordavo questo episodio, ma è interessante eh, è chiaro che è in corso, no? come si diceva anche ieri, una risemantizzazione della mascherina. Eh, la mascherina non è più soltanto un dispositivo di protezione rispetto al virus, eh, tuttavia io credo che questa risemantizzazione eh, abbia dei limiti. No? Immaginate, io sinceramente me lo auguro, no? che tutti... Ehm, veniamo fuori prima o poi da questa ci tiriamo fuori prima o poi da questa situazione eliminiamo in qualche modo vaccini eccetera eccetera eh, la eh, possibilità il rischio del contagio il rischio del contagio scende a zero io non so se a quel punto le mascherine continueranno a ehm, manifestarsi nello spazio pubblico eh, non so se si possa veramente equiparare la mascherina a mh, non so, gli occhiali da sole. No? Gli occhiali da sole hanno una loro funzione, che è quella, lo diceva credo Marco, il dottor Marco Viola, eh, il, um, gli occhiali da sole hanno una funzione protettiva che è richiamata anche nel, nel nome, no? nel nome italiano, nel nome in inglese, sunglasses, shades, eccetera. E, per cui eh, la loro funzione principale è quella di proteggere gli occhi dagli effetti potenzialmente nocivi dei raggi del sole. E, tuttavia sono stati fortemente risemantizzati al punto che sì, ci può forse stupire in alcuni climi particolarmente freddi e poco assolati, ma eh, che vengano utilizzati per eh, creare eh, una specifica aura attorno al volto ehm, non ci stupisce c'è una risemantizzazione che è legata alla funzione primaria del dispositivo ma che va al di là del dispositivo eh, però ecco ehm, non so se questa risemantizzazione sarà possibile per la mascherina 
ma perché diciamo la risemantizzazione è molto più difficile perché è legata alla struttura e alla fenomenologia stessa della mascherina eh, cioè un conto è attribuire una, una specie di aura no? una connotazione semantica anche di fascino di seduzione a un dispositivo che funzionalmente eh, deve proteggere eh, gli occhi dei raggi del sole e per farlo deve diminuire la visibilità di questi occhi ehm, da parte di uno sguardo esterno no? è questo che succede funzionalmente con gli occhiali da sole gli occhiali da sole devono proteggere i miei occhi dal sole per farlo non possono essere trasparenti no? non esistono degli occhiali da sole trasparenti devono per forza creare un filtro cromatico tra i raggi del sole e i miei occhi nel creare questo filtro però eh, lo creano non soltanto per il sole ma anche per degli sguardi quindi sostanzialmente riducono la visibilità del mio sguardo questo ridurre la visibilità del mio sguardo ha degli effetti semantici che sono però vissuti eh, nella cultura occidentale, del, diciamo, nel, nella quale gli occhiali da sole si sono diffusi, eh, come eh, potenzialmente ad effetto seduttivo, ad effetto erotico. Eh, perché gli occhiali da sole possono essere un dispositivo erotico? Perché eh, sostanzialmente mi permettono di eh, dirigere il mio sguardo senza che si capisca la direzione di questo sguardo stesso. Sostanzialmente attribuiscono un potere al volto, che è un po' come il potere, no? ricordate il mito platonico dell'anello di Gige, no? il fatto di poter essere in società senza essere visti. Eh, che cosa possiamo fare quando abbiamo gli occhiali da sole che non faremmo invece se non li portassimo? Beh, per esempio possiamo fissare qualcuno, no? eh, possiamo fissare qualcuno e concentrare il nostro sguardo in modo che sarebbe forse socialmente inaccettabile, no? possiamo dissimulare ehm, come dei giocatori di poker le emozioni che si eh, sprigionano eh, a partire dalla conformazione del nostro sguardo. E se pensiamo invece alla mascherina, sì, la mascherina dal punto di vista funzionale fa la stessa cosa, cioè invece dei raggi avete il virus o comunque diciamo dei flussi d'aria che sono possibili, eh, diciamo possibilmente forieri di virus, avete un filtro, questo filtro però eh, sì, è eh, cromatico, non necessariamente deve esserlo, no? il dottor Viola per esempio sta studiando queste mascherine trasparenti, dove però il, il filtro cromatico non viene eh, eliminato completamente, no? quando voi avete una mascherina trasparente, non è che vi si vede il volto, vi si vede il volto dietro un celofan, no? come una, una confezione diciamo, di plastica che nasconda un frutto in un supermercato. Non è che vedete il frutto, però lo vedete meglio che se invece il frutto fosse ricoperto da cartone oppure da un tessuto. Quindi eh, avete, come nel caso dei raggi di sole, eh, un agente esterno potenzialmente nocivo, eh, mh, un filtro, questo filtro poi però modifica anche la visibilità del volto. Eh, il problema è che, allora ci sono due problemi, il primo problema è che eh, gli occhiali da sole sono comunque stati associati sempre ad un diciamo, script socioculturale essenzialmente euforico, alla spiaggia, al divertimento, all'aria aperta, quando vediamo un paio di occhiali da sole non pensiamo, ah sì, un povero contadino che deve stare 12 ore a raccogliere i pomodori eh, nelle campagne della Puglia e meno male che ci sono gli occhiali da sole per proteggerlo. No, noi pensiamo, ah che bello, queste estate finalmente andiamo in spiaggia. No? Quindi c'è questo script euforico che ovviamente non c'è assolutamente per la mascherina. Non c'è uno script euforico per la mascherina. E non credo che ci possa essere. Ehm, però eh, poi il punto fondamentale è che la parte del volto eh, di cui la mascherina riduce la visibilità eh, rispetto allo sguardo esterno non è lo sguardo eh, ma è invece la parte del volto che noi utilizziamo per comunicare verbalmente eh, quindi sostanzialmente la nostra bocca eh, attraverso la quale comunichiamo anche delle emozioni eh, però eh, è fondamentale sottolineare il fatto che 
eh, questo nascondimento non è visto come un nascondimento che è potenziatore, no? non è un nascondimento che potenzia. Eh, io posso diciamo, sentirmi in una situazione di potere perché posso guardare senza essere visto, come nel caso della, degli occhiali da sole, ma ehm, invece nel caso della mascherina sostanzialmente eh, c'è un eh, disequilibrio tra un mismatch, no? uno scostamento tra la parte del volto che viene coperta, cioè la bocca, e la visibilità di questa copertura. No? Eh, negli occhiali da sole eh, si copre la parte del volto che è collegata allo sguardo e si impedisce lo sguardo altrui verso questa parte del volto. Ma invece nel caso di una mascherina si impedisce lo sguardo altrui verso una parte del volto che non è invece quella, diciamo, deputata a dirigere o a uh, organizzare lo sguardo, ma invece quella collegata sostanzialmente al linguaggio, alla comunicazione. Ecco perché una rifunzionalizzazione della mascherina ha limiti fortissimi, eppure, eh, dice il dottor Bonomo, all'inizio della pandemia sembrava che mettere la mascherina in, in compagnia di altre persone significasse implicitamente che tali persone non fossero congiunte, che è una sorta di divisione tra congiunti e non congiunti. Beh, certo, sì, questo è ancora, è ancora molto, diciamo, molto spiacevole ed è forse uno degli aspetti del vivere in società con eh, la mascherina che più colpisce. No? Mi ricordo dopo il confinamento, eccetera, eccetera, eh, finalmente dopo mesi andai a trovare mia madre che vive nel sud Italia Devo dire che insomma, faceva molta impressione no? stare in casa con lei con la mascherina, tutte e due distanti con la mascherina, no? è una cosa abbastanza agghiacciante, eppure necessaria perché io appunto ero continuamente in treni, aerei, eccetera, in questi bagni di Covid che faccio nei miei viaggi. E, ehm, e poi invece il dottor Sgoi dice potrebbero spostare l'interesse nella mascherina della protezione del virus alla crisi ecologica, alla protezione dell'inquinamento, per mantenerla viva, intendo. Sì, questo in effetti in parte già esisteva, no? c'è stato un momento, io ero in Polonia come professore invitato, eh, siamo alla fine di febbraio 2020, scoppia questa isteria collettiva rispetto alla mascherina, isteria in parte giustificata perché in effetti la produzione locale di mascherine era insufficiente per il fabbisogno di un'intera popolazione, quotidiano di un'intera popolazione, in Polonia, a Varsavia, dove ancora credo non ci, fossero, non ci fosse neppure un caso di Covid, già a metà del febbraio, terza settimana di febbraio 2020, non si trovavano più delle mascherine, non si trovavano più le mascherine nemmeno nelle farmacie. E allora io ricordo che eh, ne andai a comprare in questo negozietto per ciclisti che trovai a, a, per caso a Cracovia, e dove vendevano queste bellissime mascherine appunto che dovevano proteggere dal, dall'inquinamento poi non so esattamente se, se fossero adeguate anche per altri scopi comunque diciamo eh, permettevano di ehm, eh, eh, dissimularsi diciamo o di, di presentarsi in maniera corretta nei mezzi di trasporto in Italia e altrove e, quindi c'era già un uso della mascherina legata all'inquinamento, però era legata a situazioni molto particolari, cioè io sono in mezzo al traffico urbano, io sono eh, un ciclista mh, circondato da auto, e, mh, il vero diciamo, trauma della mascherina è quando invece eh, ci si vede, si vede il proprio volto in una situazione che non è collegata necessariamente allo spazio pubblico macro, ma allo spazio pubblico micro o perlomeno lo, o, o addirittura lo spazio privato. Cioè il problema è quando io mi siedo in un parco eh, con tre amici che conosco da vent'anni e lì eh, portare la mascherina, non portarla, ovviamente eh, dal punto di vista diciamo, epidemiologico tutto spingerebbe a portarla, eppure è eh, una situazione molto diversa rispetto al fatto che ah, io mi trovo diciamo, nel traffico di Torino e metto la mascherina perché mi proteggo dall'inquinamento. Quindi anche in quel caso c'è una, eh, una forte difficoltà di risemantizzarla. E, io credo che invece permarrà nello spazio visivo delle nostre società 
fino a che permarrà non il virus, perché il virus probabilmente insomma, non verrà non eliminato del tutto, perché non sarà eliminato, però sarà diciamo, eh, addomesticato, per così dire. No? Il rischio verrà molto limitato, però rimarrà per molto tempo ancora la paura del contagio. E questo ha fatto sì che, per esempio, in molte società eh, asiatiche la mascherina fosse portata per molto tempo dopo gli episodi di SARS e sicuramente eh, le mascherine continueranno a essere visibili nei mezzi di trasporto, sugli aerei eccetera eccetera anche dopo che diciamo il eh, pericolo del contagio di questo virus sarà passato anche perché oramai devo dire che forse si instaura nella nostra cultura eh, globale l'idea che eh, l'aria sia nociva, no? eh, però ecco questa eh, eh, nocuità dell'aria legata al virus è comunque diversa, io credo, rispetto a quella dell'inquinamento. L'inquinamento eh, probabilmente uccide più del virus statisticamente in città come Torino, eh, anche se dovrei controllare queste affermazioni, eh, eppure mh, diciamo che eh, viene percepito come un agente nocivo diffuso eh, e soprattutto non collegato al contatto con l'altro essere umano quindi eh, è proprio per questo che eh, diciamo non eh, genera quel sindrome che invece credo che si eh, instaurerà in molte delle culture mondiali se non in tutte rispetto alla possibile pericolosità dell'aria, cioè noi eh, siamo in una fase della, dello sviluppo delle nostre diciamo, culture eh, che riguardano anche il volto, eh, nel quale eh, stiamo sempre più eh, costruendo l'idea che l'aria che respiriamo in realtà è potenzialmente nociva, ma non perché appunto ci sia l'inquinamento, ma perché possono esserci degli agenti nocivi nell'aria dei virus che determinerebbero poi il mio progressivo diciamo, deterioramento e addirittura il decesso in tempi molto più rapidi rispetto a quello dell'inquinamento. Questo è il punto, no? è anche quello che la semiotica chiama l'aspettualità del, uh, del pericolo, cioè un conto è sottoporsi quotidianamente a un pericolo uh, che a lungo termine quasi sicuramente porterà al mio decesso e un conto è sottoposto invece a un pericolo che in maniera puntuale e immediata potrebbe determinare il mio decesso, cioè un conto è avere paura di fumare perché tra 40 anni o tra 30 anni avrò quasi sicuramente una, un tumore e un conto è avere paura di salire su un aereo, cioè statisticamente l'aereo è molto più sicuro della sigaretta, eh, però... Eh, eh, dal punto di vista della aspettualità del rischio, l'idea che qualcosa non funzioni all'improvviso e che io inevitabilmente muoia in un incidente aereo è molto più paralizzante. No? Ricordate questo episodio di Bertrand Russell, il grande filosofo britannico, storico della filosofia, che era un grande fumatore, che diceva, ah no, ma guardate che il, il fumo in realtà mi ha salvato la vita, perché in effetti era stato vittima di un incidente aereo, all'epoca negli aerei si poteva fumare, e a lui era stato eh, diciamo, destinato una, una posizione, una, una, eh, gli si era detto di sedersi nell'aereo nel, in un posto destinato ai fumatori, e i fumatori erano stati risparmiati in quell'incidente aereo. Adesso, non so, Bertrand Russell poi raccontava questo, non so quanto fosse vero o falso, però ecco, come vedete c'è anche un'idea del rischio, che è legata al tempo. Maggio 2020 è stato strano e impressionante iniziare a vedere le vetrine dei negozi di abbigliamento con i manichini che indossavano una mascherina, come se il messaggio fosse ormai far parte del nostro vestito quotidiano anche come accessorio di moda. Sì, io però diciamo, eh, vi inviterei in generale rispetto alla pubblicità e rispetto alla moda, soprattutto alla, alla moda vestimentaria, di non esagerare eh, diciamo il contenuto di rivelazione sociale della pubblicità o della moda cioè la pubblicità e la moda non creano le tendenze sociali le seguono quindi eh, abbiamo visto le sfilate delle modelle dei modelli con la mascherina eh, effettivamente nelle vetrine si sono eh, spesso messi dei manichini con mascherina ma crediamo veramente che quella fosse un'operazione retorica per dire, ah sì, adesso 
cominciamo anche a uh, disegnare mascherine come disegniamo dei calzini o come disegniamo dei guanti, no? non c'è nessuna differenza tra i guanti di Armani e eh, le mascherine di Armani. Io credo di no, io credo che invece fosse, come spesso fa la pubblicità, come spesso fa la moda, eh, un modo di utilizzare una preoccupazione contemporanea, anche un'ansia contemporanea, per generare attenzione. Cioè io metto le mascherine sui manichini e tu mi guardi, ma guardi anche gli altri vestiti, poi non credo che entrerai nel negozio per comprare quella mascherina, no? comprerai magari tutti gli altri vestiti, però intanto avrò attirato la tua attenzione. Quindi attenzione ehm, rispetto alla moda e alla pubblicità a non leggerle troppo nella, nella letteralità dei loro contenuti. No? Spesso ehm, anche gli studenti, non tanto gli studenti della magistrale, quanto studenti e studentesse della triennale, delle triennali di comunicazione, dimenticano che lo scopo principale di una vetrina non è di trasmettere un messaggio, un messaggio sociale, eh, lo scopo principale di un messaggio pubblicitario non è quella di eh, diciamo, trasmettere delle ideologie, ma è quella di vendere, no? la pubblicità vuole vendere, la vetrina vuole vendere, quindi non si può prescindere da questo, da questo modo. Secondo me era un modo per invitare a proteggersi, sì, può darsi, ma insomma non è, non è così... Eh... Interessante, nel senso che non credo che abbia spostato no, il fatto che nelle vetrine comparissero eh, delle, delle mascherine sui manichini, non credo che abbia spostato di molto la cultura del, della mascherina. Cioè se ehm, cominciamo a percepire le mascherine come accessori è perché sono già diventati degli accessori. No? Eh, eh, queste operazioni di moda oggi non sono rivoluzionarie, sarebbero state rivoluzionarie prima della pandemia, cioè se Gucci eh, nel dicembre del 2019 avesse lanciato tutta una sfilata in cui tutti i modelli e tutte le modelle erano mascherati e mascherate con delle mascherine, allora sì, quella sarebbe stata una grande previsione di tendenze anche... Eh, sì, in effetti sono d'accordo con lei, dottoressa Bianchi. Eh, cioè, eh, dove sta il genio? Sì, tu Gucci fai una sfilata nel 2018 in cui metti le mascherine su tutti i volti, allora lì ti dico, guarda, sei veramente un genio e hai capito dove sta andando il mondo. Eh, però in realtà non è stato così, cioè, è stato un seguire, un trend che si era già, diciamo, coagulato a livello sociale. Però adesso dobbiamo veramente interromperci e, diciamo, ci fermiamo sulla riflessione di Alfred Gell sulla necessità di costruire delle tipologie del senso, della, scusate, della, della riflessione di Alfred Gell sulla necessità di studiare la maschera rispetto al volto come modificazione del volto quotidiano e ehm, eh, passiamo invece alla seconda parte di questa lezione, cioè alla eh, conferenza che viene oggi presentata grazie alla collaborazione delle professoresse il Sassoro e Cristina Goto, quindi vi direi di fare mh, tre minuti di pausa fino alle 9.10, eh, il tempo di un rapido caffè e poi, eh, tanto non possiamo più andare in nessun bar, quindi la pausa caffè si riduce di conseguenza, ehm, e alle 9.10 ricominciamo con una presentazione della, della conferenza di oggi e poi con uh, la uh, conferenza stessa l'eventuale discussione. Riprendiamo comunque questi commenti anche del dottor Livraghi. La leggerezza non scenanza di indossare la mascherina, ma tenendo il naso fuori, molto più è una specie di doppia morale. <ride> sì, sì, sì. No, no, vi ho già detto, no? questo tipo che avevo incontrato nella metropolitana di Parigi è stato il migliore, questo che starnutiva abbassandosi la maschera nella metropolitana. Questo era il migliore, eh? il, mio, il mio idolo. Va bene. Allora, ci vediamo tra due minuti, tre minuti. Grazie. Okay. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. <laughs> good morning, Monica. How are you? Very welcome. We can't hear you. <laughs> good morning. Hello. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, very good. So, well, I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Cristina. Yes. Hi, Monica. Hi. Good morning, Cristina. Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's a real Hello. pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, Monica, it's, it's a very pleasure for us. We're very happy to have you 
with us today. So yeah, I hope that you know the awakening was uh, wasn't too early. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, thank you. It's okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we start an hours later, but because we we are yeah in Italy. Well, yeah, they no, are in Italy. I'm in Spain, but so yeah. that's why they, we are so brave. But in yeah, in reality, it's it's eight o'clock, so it's not seven o'clock. So. And I <laughs> Um, so, well, basically, um, I think that for um, sharing the, your presentation... Yeah, I, can I try quickly and see yeah, if of it... course, of course. Okay. So, like this. Is it coming? No. Not yet. No. I keep putting my, like... No? Yes. Oh, yes. No, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Are you going? To, are you going to share any video? Because no. if okay, perfect. Oh, no, thank you, Christina. No. Um. Yeah. I keep it. I mean, I've got a lot of slides, a lot of pictures. I thought people would like that. <laughs> uh, but um, how do I stop sharing? Hold on. Uh, um, maybe in the same. Oh, we can we can live like that. We yeah. can say yeah. like that, yeah, of course, because we're gonna start very, uh, very, very, yeah, in in very short time. So basically, we can basically right. stay like that, and then I will uh, very very shortly introduce you, and then uh, uh, we start, and then afterwards uh, we we're gonna pick some questions, some observation, and uh, and yeah. I'm sure. Okay. I, 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 um, hold on. Let me just see. I would like to know how to. Ah, vale. Stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> After, now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now. <laughs> vale. Yeah. So I. Vale. Yeah. Okay. I'll try it in a minute again. But I'm, I know now how to do it. Okay. Good. Hi, hello everybody. Hi, hi Monica. Nice Hi, to meet you. This is Massimo. Hi, Massimo. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce the introduction because now uh, Elsa and Christina will introduce our speaker today and many thanks to her for participating in our in our seminar. So uh, either Elsa or Christina, the floor is yours and we can proceed okay. with the presentation. Okay, thanks, Professor Leone. Well, uh, another um, opportunity today for uh, uh, taking a step uh, uh, forward to a topic that is uh, kind of emerging, especially in the last two uh, talks, that is the uh, configuration between the face and the public space. So either, uh, yeah, both uh, yesterday and today, we mentioned Professor Leone and, and, the, and the speakers yesterday mentioned about uh, her, what's, uh, what's the effect of meaning of having the face covered uh, either by a niqab or a mask in, in public space. So, yeah, uh, we have, uh, we have um, today, um, here with us, Professor uh, Monica Degen, uh, that will help us to to go deep in this uh, in this analysis of uh, how the public space is relevant uh, for the face and and vice versa. So I just shortly introduce uh, Monica, who is a reader in cultural sociology and political and social sciences at the Brunel uh, University in London. Her research focuses on politics of space with a particular interest in the way sensory, temporal and emotional dimension underpin urban culture and politics. Over the years, she has been working on several international funding research projects with architects, uh, local council, museum creator and the general public to research uh, urban transformation and the role of the senses in framing architectural practicals Everyday, everyday life and uh, culture in city, in different city, from Doha, Qatar, to Cologne in Germany, uh, obviously Barcelona, where uh, Monica is a kind of a reference. In all of these uh, researches and interests and thoughts about uh, flows, 
and uh, also tourist flow. That's how I, I, I got to know Hema's, um, sorry, Monica's uh, work. And also, uh, Monica in uh, 2016 should be awarded with the prestigious British Academy Fellowship to research timescape to urban change. And more recently, she has been working on developing digital tools to capture the sense of place of cities and the ways in which urban environment are stratified by power relationship. Uh, yeah, I can mention some um, important projects uh, where uh, Monica uh, is involved with, such as Sensory uh, Smithfield and uh, Sensory City. They have been the pleasure of um, of got to know in a previous conference where uh, uh, Monica and me we we yeah we met, and she uh, has published her work in in uh, lots of international journal, and we are very. Uh, looking for a word to her new, um, yeah, new book uh, this year that she will call a new urban aesthetics experiencing urban change digitally. So uh, I think that uh, your talk, uh, Monica, today is very related to uh, to the the topic uh, of your. Uh, Next book, in fact, uh, uh, the title of your presentation is A Dramatic Urban Aesthetics, Instagram and the Reconfiguration of Urban Experience. So we're very happy to have you, uh, have, uh, you with us today. And uh, yeah, la the floor is yours, Monica. Well, thank you very much. And before I go on to, on to the PowerPoint, I wanted to see everybody's face, but I can see that in Italy, like in Britain, the students are all hiding. Uh, but I'll say good morning, <laughs> buenos dias, um, buongiorno. And yeah, I'll start with up uploading the presentation and I'll start it now then. I hope you can um, see it. Yes. Um, okay, let me just do the full slideshow and play from the start. Yeah. So, very, let me take very start. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, just feel free to interrupt me if yeah, there are any problems yeah. or, or you yeah. can't hear me or anything. So, okay. So, first of all, I want to say thank you very, very much to um, Professor uh, Massimo Leone, uh, to Elsa Soro and Cristina Votto for inviting me um, today and, and letting me share your time uh, with me. So let me contextualize a little bit today's um, talk. Um, I have basically, uh, this, I, I would like to discuss some arguments that I've developed with um, Gillian Rose from uh, Oxford University in our forthcoming book, The New Urban Aesthetic, Experiencing Urban Change Digitally. Um, and this will be published at the end of this year by Bloomsbury. And in the book, we were really interested in making sense and understanding much more um, how everyday sensory experiences of a city are mediated by digital technologies. And we argue that in the current era of aesthetic capitalism, often described as this kind of experience economy where everything is about um, really um, consuming, um, you know, experiences, whether it's in shops, think about when you go in a shop and, you know, the music, the smell, the um, design of the shop is about, you know, consuming this experience of being somewhere, how that actually, this experience economy is creating new sensorial dynamics that are emerging through the interrelationship between diverse new digital de technologies, the intensified urban redevelopment in cities and our bodies. So in the book, we focus on computer generated images, on smartphone apps, on social media images to analyze um, how they mediate everyday urban sensations and reshape the ways that cities are planned, branded, represented and designed. And thinking about the topic of your research, um, uh, face aesthetics in contemporary e-technological societies, we could say that in a way we draw a link between, on the one hand, this kind of intensification of urban redevelopment that has happened across, especially the, the global north in the late 1990s, where you know city governments are really aiming to change the face of the city and we draw relationships to 
you know, two, on the other hand, the pervasive use of digital technologies in planning, branding and using the cities. And we're really trying to think about how digital visualizations are supporting this effort of city governments to give their cities a brand new face. So let me explain this uh, a bit more with an anecdote. When we did research in 2008 um, in two cities in the UK, and we asked people to describe their high streets in Milton Keynes and Bedford, they gave us very rich sensory answers that you know people would give about their hometowns. They described the sounds, the smells, the colors of their surrounding landscape. However, when we did similar interviews in 2018 with a similar piece of research and asked people how they experienced their neighborhood, the encounter was somehow different. A third, a third interlocutor appeared, the smartphone. Our interviewees still described their sensory engagements with the built space, but smartphones were clearly intervening in their engagements as they photographed the neighborhood, snapped their lunch um, or, uh, or, or, or buildings during their lunch break. Or others had come to the neighborhood because of a media post from a friend, influencer or local business. And the neighborhood itself was the site of highly crafted digital images on billboards around sites earmarked for demolition and picturing CGI constructed images of the future and you know, other images that were created by um, digital um, vis visualizations. So our interviews were also interrupted constantly by the beeps of the phones. The interviewees would also be aware that the phones were generating data about their activities, their location, their likes, their networks, their favorites. So our book is about some of the ways in which digital technologies are part of a shift in the everyday sensory experiencing of urban environments. Those digital in interventions are what we refer to in the book as a new urban aesthetic, namely the ways in which the digital is now implicated in reconfiguring contemporary urban experience. And my talk today will focus only on one little aspect of the book by examining how Instagram is rearticulating branding processes, um, physically transforming our cities and radically changing our experience in and of cities. While there has been an extensive critique of platform urbanism, of course, and neoliberal neoliberalization of urban governments, very little has been said about the aesthetic forms of power in cities and how aesthetic forms of power are enacted in the sensorial corporeal grafts of urban digital embodiments. And this is really the gap that our research and this forthcoming book is trying to fill. So I'll give you a bit of background information on Instagram, although most of, of you probably already know, but it's really interesting to see the facts. So Instagram has more than, and remember Instagram only started in 2010. Yeah, so it's not that old yet, but Instagram has nowadays more than 1 billion users, um, which means 12% of the world population and more than 95 million posts are uploaded every day. Yeah, 95 million posts every day. In recent years, the sharing of images of urban environments on social media, of course, has become pervasive radically transforming the ways we represent and experience not just ourselves and our faces, but also urban places. So social media platforms like Facebook, WhatsApp, Uber, Instagram, Foursquare, Deliveroo, Lyft, and many, many others now mediate many everyday embodied experiences of urban space. In other ways, uh, in other words, they are rapidly changing how people experience cities and how even cities work. While urban scholarship has paid some attention to how social media platforms generate big data and to their social networking capacities to, uh, to organize, for example, urban campaigns and protest, 
um, as we saw in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, there has been relatively little attention paid to the intersection of social media with urban branding. Yet architects, developers, city councillors, tourism agencies and retail retailers are increasingly aware of the branding power of social media, in particular of Instagram. So as the Guardian um, journalist um, John Wainwright argued recently, for place to be shared on Instagram is no longer a chance byproduct of a photogenic design, but a primary concern that drives the ambitions of clients and designers. The idea of doing it for the gram has moved from the preserve of like hungry teens to board meeting discussions and multi-million pound budgets. And I was really interested, we can talk about this later if you want, about this campaign by the city of Vienna that consciously is trying to say, see Vienna, not hashtag Vienna. So we can see how important Instagram has become, um, you know, in urban branding, and especially here, this is an interesting example, how they're subverting, you know, this kind of urban branding. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I would like to discuss um, and focus the ways in which the social media platform Instagram has impacted on an area in London, earmarked for cultural uh, development, the so-called Culture Mile, uh, which was unveiled in 2017 and described as one of Europe's largest cultural capital projects. So a lot of billions of pounds, euros are invested here. So just to, to situate you, I mean, most of you will probably know London, there's the River Thames, the blue at the bottom, um, the famous river, then you can see St. Paul's Cathedral, number 12 is the Tate Modern with a famous bridge by Norman Foster. And this um, area, the Culture Mile, is the, um, the soft blue at the top with the yellow. That's the whole area Culture Mile zone. And what we did is we focused basically on everyday routines of this area, including Instagramming, and also analyzed the social media campaigns by a placemaking organization in charge of branding this culture mile. And by doing this, I want to analyze how new forms of planning are emerging that deeply changes the nature of urban life and urban development and how we actually experience the city. So the area encompasses uh, the northwest London of London, uh, uh, the northwest corner, sorry, of London's historic city, and is planned to diversify the activities of the. I mean, we're here talking about the financial city, so diversifying the activities of the um, financial city from tourism, uh, from finance to tourism and culture. Um, and I need to say, of course, this is all pre-COVID pre-Brexit. <laughs> and um, some arguments are that uh, London wants to diversify more into tourism and culture because they thought with Brexit, you know, their financial power might be less important in Europe. So the transformation is driven by a public-private partnership organization called Culture Mile and supported by the Corporation of London, which is the local government in this area, and a number of cultural institutions that implement the Culture Mile under a common brand. So their museums are part of it, um, uh, music venues, etc. And the expectation is that the latent potential, and this is a quote, that the latent potential within the area's creative sector is unlocked, adding over four four billion pounds per year to the output of the city of London and generating up to 50,000 new jobs. So much of the area, just to show you a bit the area from moving from Turin to, <laughs> to Smithfield, is a, a very a rich mix of architectural styles. It's the oldest part of the city, so it still has a medieval street pattern, but also, of course, as you can see, you know, um, it has um, medieval buildings, the Barbican, uh, a brutalist housing estate, but also 21st century offices. And most importantly, at, at the top of the, on the left, you can see Smithfield Market, Britain's oldest and still large, um, still operating wholesale meat market housed in a Grand Victorian building. 
However, if the uh, area is close to the financial center of London, it is not an obvious destination for London tourists. I imagine that most of you who've been to London have not been in the area, although it's 10 minutes from the Tate Modern, 10 minutes from St. Paul's, etc. So the Culture Mart project really plans to change this and to bring this area into the tourist gaze. Yeah. Um, and a central part of it and uh, of its efforts entailed the Museum of London moving from its current location to this market, to this empty market you can see on, um, on the left. Some of it, like I said, uh, the upper half is still working, the lower half um, is, is um, empty. And, and they're going to move there in 2024, and they hope to increase visitor numbers to from 900,000 to 2 million a year. And this is really the flagship institution of the Culture Mile. So, so far, so good. Yeah, you, you know this story. It's probably happening also in Turin of cultural regeneration. We can see a very typical process of cultural regeneration. However, I, we wanted to give this analysis a new reading by reflecting on the project's branding campaign on Instagram and how the area is pictured on Instagram also by the area's visitor, tourists, residents and workers. Because with Instagram, they, and it's a quote from Toscano actually, she says, we explore the city and public spaces and above all, we communicate experiences. We also generate new images and new experiences of the city through Instagram. So to do this, I want to talk about two features that I have identified through my research. And firstly, that much of the digital branding and urban activities of the Culture Mile project act to prepare the ground for these future developments. What um, Ben Anderson has described as anticipatory urbanism. And in this talk, I reflect how anticipatory uh, urbanism and urban branding have increasingly become mediated by social media. This allows me to move to my second argument, namely to define the dramatic urban aesthetic the Culture Mile branding is aiming to enact. And to do so, uh, I will look at hashtags of Smithfield Market and Culture Mile because it allows you to understand how the dramatic new urban aesthetic is shared across Instagrammatic mediations in the area. So let's look then at the first um, issue, how Instagram has become part of an expressive infrastructure, and this is a term that Nigel Swift uses, expressive infrastructure for branding. So since the launch of the Culture Mile in 2017, the media has reported it as a genuine regener regeneration, which will create a major destination that will deliver new experiences for everyone. The Culture Mile has also been integrated into the City of London's more recent cultural strategy, of course. And the new strategy continues to make connections between the redesign of the area and cultural activities. The strategy's first objective is to transform the city's public realm and physical infrastructure, making it more open, distinct, welcoming, and culturally vibrant destination. Again, a very common um, discourse. But all these activities assume that the current state of the culture mile and its wording, you know, implies that including Smithfield is an area that needs improving. Its current state is presented as hard to reach, difficult to navigate, not welcoming, not distinct, not providing great experiences. And this unattractive present is enacted by the particular version of the future profit by the culture mile. And implicit in this future scenario building are the promise for a better kind of urban space, of course. We argue that the Culture Mile Regeneration Project can therefore be understood as a form of anticipatory ur urbanism. So no building work has happened yet. Yeah. So it's all on Instagram and it's anticipating a future. What they've done, which I'll reflect now, is events and some public art that you can see there on in these images. In his discussion of futurities, Ben Anderson insists that particular versions of the future always exist in the present moment. 
they are presented as an absence, something that has not yet happened. But Anderson argues that experiencing possible futures in the present is crucial to make the future happen. Quote, futures are constantly embodied, experienced, told, narrated and imagined, performed, wished, planned, daydreamed, symbolized and sensed. End of quote. I analyze the various practices which give content to a specific future for the culture mile and in particular for uh, Smithfield Market's present and how Instagram mediates these practices. In his work, Anderson identifies three key practices which I've um, highlighted here on this slide. Firstly, the practices that are common in this future anticipatory urbanism are practices of calculation which tries to say, you know, how the future, the indeterminacy of the future is made specific and calculable with numbers to provide uh, certainty. This can be seen in the expectations of how much economic income the urban transformation will generate in the future and how many visitors are expected to visit the area. As I said before, you know, 4 billion pounds, 2 million new museum uh, visitors, etc. But, you know, this is quite a typical way and, and we've seen that a lot. But more interestingly, uh, Anderson points to two more uh, practices, which he calls the practices of imagination or what he also calls acts of creative fabulation, where uh, there can be visualization or stories where making the future present becomes a question of creating effectively imbued representations that move and mobilize. And then lastly, the practices of performing um, the future that draw on embodied performances and make futures present experientially. And it's where um, the space of the exercise becomes an occasion for experiencing how a future e event might even feel. And that's you know, what Anderson argues. So let's look at these two last practices, the practices of imagination and the practices of performing, which I'm really interested in the culture now. So place branding has become, of course, uh, part of a very widespread urban governance strategy to manage experiences and perceptions of place, following by now the rationale that a place first decides what kind of brand it wants and then it becomes in, an enhanced a development to support that brand. So branding is the argument comes first and then we'll see how we, we develop the area. Yeah, the, the, the face of the neighborhood almost, the imagined face is more important than the actual ground. The actual ground gets changed after they know the image that they want to create. So place branding relies on creating a favorable image of a place by producing or emphasizing certain functional, symbolic and experiential aspects to attract visitors and investment. And much of this urban branding is now undertaken by these kind of formalized private public coalitions like the Culture Mile. And indeed, there has been a clear co-evolution of urban redevelopment and branding, where increasingly the two processes work hand in hand and are part of uh, urban policy. So almost emerging as a hybrid materialization, creating new spatial settings. And during this process, the image of a neighborhood is an important element to be managed and shaped as it informs perceptions and expectations of place. As the culture mile manager explained how we are encouraging more people to change their perceptions and build new ideas around the culture mile and um, the culture mile um, leads to repeat visits, that's the question we need to answer. So place branding strategies are well known to utilize specially visual media to anticipate the face, the feel and the look of places. With the rise of social media in the last decade, place branding strategies have, of course, increase, increasingly drawn on a range of digital platforms to disseminate the information and promote positive interpretations of the places they brand. 
as platform in as a platform instagram emphasizes an, uh, the image differentiating it from other networks and making it particularly relevant for the analysis of how aesthetics experience or you know experiences are branded and indeed instagram's visual aesthetic is a crucial feature of its popularity and global appeal it has a global language so to speak the visual and you probably know this quote already, but Manovich, for example, um, who did one of the first studies on Instagram, argued, if Google is an information retrieval service, Twitter is for news and links exchange, Facebook is for social communication, and Flickr for image archiving, Instagram is for aesthetic visual communication. So for us, Instagram posts, um, for us, Instagram posts uh, reveal something about the user's embodied point of view in place and their perception of places. Um, Instagram reveals the aesthetic sensibility as the users choreograph certain images, choose certain views over others. The affordances of the smartphone and the Instagram app, taking photos or videos, applying filters, choosing which image to upload, adding captions and hashtags, further entail a series of aesthetic strategies and choices. Furthermore, the structure of Instagram, <coughs> like other social media, enhances connections with other users using hashtags. And the interactive nature of social media has transformed branding communication into a two-way process in which companies and customers enter into dialogue. So on Instagram, corporations and organizations are able to engage with target audiences by following them, using hashtags and liking their posts. And this has moved urban inhabitants from just being the target of place branding to becoming producers. So citizens are now producers of the marketing of, of places. And social media, such as Instagram, enables residents or visitors to engage with place branding communication efforts, as the technology allows non-professionals to create and share images and texts. And these images and texts that we as users of place produce and I'm quoting here um, two academics called Kellender and Kassinger, are assumed to provide even more authentic and innovative images of our place than professional photographs produced for strategic reasons. So most of us, um, you know, the argument is that increasingly we as consumers go to Instagram to find out about where to eat, what things to do, which trendy places and cities to visit, etc. We don't rely on official branding strategies, but increasingly on other users of places. So user-generated content has become one of the most trusted and diverse sources for online information for tourists. And Akuti et al. conclude from their research, for example, on images on London and Paris on Instagram, that, quote, social media contributes to and accelerates place brand identity and brand image formation facilitating and enabling stakeholders who constitute and live the brand in expressing their mental picture of a specific area and a place, end of quote. So what our discussion so far highlights is that once place branding moves onto social media, it becomes embedded into a much wider set of communicative processes. It moves into many people's everyday experiencing of urban life. Users of space collaborate or are enrolled into branding processes, but also post capture their own experiences of place. Indeed, when we ask the culture man manager, marketing manager whether, in his view, social media is transforming place making, he told us, and here's the quote Yes, you know, social media has transformed place making. If you think about what people used to curate, um, their own experiences of an area, not just in terms of constituting outwardly that, that experience, but for themselves. Like, it's not just about showing to other people that you've been to a place, it's also for you, do you remember that place? What are the things you were really excited about uh, and by? It absolutely has changed placemaking. 
And just because they will become more important later, the image here is one of the first Smithfield market post on Instagram in 2005, I think, or so, 2003, yeah. As we emphasize throughout the book, sensory embodiments are mediated by digital technologies. And in this case study, we can see how embodied users of space are caught up in the lift experiencing of branding, making their own images, recording their own experiences, looking at the posts and views of others and caught up in those images and places. And indeed, some theorists like Wissinger have, are arguing that Instagram combined with the smartphone, which it runs, can be viewed as attention capture and calibration um, devices. However, Instagram mediates bodies in other ways too. And similar to the ways in which fashion photographers, models and viewers affect each other by channeling attention through their careful choreographing of images, from posing in particular ways to editing the images, Instagram users similarly engage in aesthetic labor as they make judgments about how to capture, edit, and circulate images of their lived experiences. And, the way, and they watch flows of images and modify them by scrolling, liking, and commenting. So let's then look at this dramatic urban aesthetic a bit closer. Um, and let's look closer at the aesthetic labor involved in the Culture Mile strategic branding online, analyzing what considerations have underpinned the Culture Mile's official Instagram activities. So here I'm analyzing uh, the Culture Mile's official Instagram um, channel. And I hope to show you how branding, social media posting, and events are increasingly interlocked so that Instagram activity is central to creating what we have defined as a dramatic new urban aesthetic. So the first Culture Mile Instagram post was on the 29th of November 2017, when the Culture Mile started. Yeah, so not long ago, three months after the Culture Mile launch. And by yesterday, the account had 177 posts and 2,600 followers, not a huge amount uh, in terms of posting, to be honest, yeah? As Instagram is relatively new place branding um, uh, emphasis for the Culture Mile. However, increasingly, its social media campaigns, and I'm quoting here the manager, quote, are becoming very important. We don't do much print at all, it's pretty limited. We recognize that social media is becoming the first point of call for people to understand, to make choices. They're going to make sh uh, more short term. They're going to be more impulse based decisions. So this impulse based decisions, the focus on that by mar urban marketing um, people is really interesting because social media is understood as an immediate intervention into ongoing experiences. Yeah, so they post tomorrow this event will happen or come and see tonight that. So yeah, interventions into ongoing experiences. And while some posts feature historical information about the area or graphics, advertising events, most of the Culture Mile posts feature images of events, installations or exhibitions hosted by the Culture Mile or its cultural organizations. And in the moment experiences are central in the culture mass engagement of audiences. Cultural experiences are crucial in the remaking of place identities during regeneration processes. Culture serves here as a catalyst to conceive of new interpretive grids by producing and mediating new sensations of place that influence the lived experience of place. And the images you can see here are of our um, art, public art um, intervention, where you had to look for words across the Culture Mile area. And of course, you had to look for words and, and the, the Culture Mile branding team knew that people would post these words, you know, across um, Instagram. So while these activities involve careful planning over long term, they're usually short temporary pop-up events limited to a weekend, night, or a few months, and advertised in advance in social media. 
And increasingly, these activities are conceived and curated in the physical urban space as moments that can be captured on the phone and be posted online, such as this um, art installation, which was called Around the Corner. And um, the marketing manager, um, and it's the, the first quote in, on the slide, basically said that one of the key benefits of this particular, you know, around the corner proposal was that we knew it was going to get traction and pick up on social media, that sense of uh, like using that sculpture or one of the sculptures as part of a story of people experiencing their, um, the, of people telling their experiences of that place. This description of the culture mile on Instagram is a reminder on um, of the German philosopher Böhmer, who uses the stage set as an analogy to understand aesthetic experiences. And what the Boomer basically says is that atmospheres are involved wherever something is being staged. Uh, wherever, oh yeah, I'm sorry, no, wherever something is staged, yeah, atmospheres are involved wherever something is being staged, wherever design is a factor, it is after all, and there's the quote at the bottom here, it is after all the purpose of the stage to set, um, um, of the stage set to provide the atmospheric background to the action, to tune the spectators to the theatrical performance, and to provide the actors with a sounding board for what they present. So when the marketing uh, manager was asked whether he drew on a particular aesthetic for the Instagram account, did not focus on the content surprisingly, of the individual images, but he started to talk to us about the layout. And you can see here the layout of the official Culture Mile account. He was talking about the layout of the Instagram app interface, explaining that the Culture Mile account only posted three images in a row, so that each row is connected and feeds into the overall appearance of what the Culture Mile is online. The uniqueness of the layout reflects the effort to establish a distinctive identity of the culture mile. And more important, though, um, was what he called the vibe, the embodied sensations that each post could um, evoke. The culture mile staff are trying to find moments that will help to sell an event. They do this by promoting experiences online not just scenes, but also feelings and emotions. Indeed, Instagram was conceived to capture the vanishing moments of everyday life, capturing the ephemeral nature of everyday life. So the Culture Mile branding on its Instagram account prepares its viewers for how future events might feel. And as the Culture Mile manager suggests, this happens by giving people a sense of what they could expect, basically finding and I'm um, sorry, finding these kind of uh, hero shots. And you can see the quote there at the top of hero images that are likely com uh, that like really compelling and exciting pieces of video content that are going to communicate a sense of energy around place and excitement around place. That is really the key. Since it, since it is not actually possible to visualize events that have not yet happened, and since the Culture Mile has not yet organized very ma uh, many events itself, the Culture Mile finds itself having to source appropriate images from other events. So the Culture Mile has to stage the vibe of the Culture Mile future by sourcing images of other events that were built on energy and reactions and excitement, as the manager explains to us. And this account of the Culture Mile's new urban aesthetic um, being in, uh, encourages us to uh, describe this aesthetic as what we call dramatic. And it is dramatic for three main reasons. It's dramatic because it's staged. As Böhmer suggests, there is a relation between different things in the posted images and between the images and the bodies that make and see them. But it is also dramatic because it is focused so often on events, on heightened moments in everyday experience. 
This might be an event staged by the Culture Mile, or it might be the moment of seeing something on Instagram which intrigues or excites. Jody Dean argues that social media are encountered in a search for affective intensity, for something that will capture attention and provide feeling. That so much of social media fails to do this uh, only produces a search for more, so that the active desire for jolts of interest, amusement and diversion drives users' restless motion across multiple screens and, and um, applications. I think we can all relate to that. We're constantly you know, scrolling on Instagram, looking for another image that would excite you because they're becoming also similar. So we're looking for the difference. Finally, it is also dramatic um, because it is an intense aesthetic. The aesthetic here is one of excitement and energy. It emerges as a combination of the affordances that Instagram provides to support and the aesthetic labor involved by Culture Mouse staff to curate sensations and um, on the Instagram account. And for the last 10 minutes of the talk, I want to just focus in the next section to and explore how this new dramatic aesthetic plays out on Instagram um, posts made by people that you know are visiting or living in the culture mile. So let's look at then um, at the social media posts that people, you know, ordinary inhabitants, visitors, tourists have posted of um, of of the culture mile and of Smithfield Market, and. Um, in this, in, in what, what's basically happening, what we need to think about is how bodies are moving now with their digital device in the city and how this has become a combination of body, digitality and urban materiality. And all of it comes together in public, um, uh, in, uh, public spaces. And in the new urban aesthetic, bodies are simultaneously basically embodied in their surrounding environment. Yeah, the now when you're walking in Turin or in London, but also at the same time, when you have your phone on you, you're also in a digital on-screen environment, which leads you to live a double, what um, Münster has called a double digital embodiment as everyday lives are being remediated into new contexts of social visibility and connection. The convergence of digital and urban embodiments is particularly intensified through the use of social media, such as Instagram, which mediates urban experiences as snapshot moments to be posted online. As Lezinski proposes, we view the Instagram platform as, and I quote here, an affective phenomenon in which we become invested, actively assembling the platform city interface every time we open an app. And in this section, I want to explore how the merging of in situ physical experiences and online images evoke particular aestheticized sensibilities and how this reconfigures our experience our living in the city. And I want to do this by briefly pointing out um, the both the culture mile in um, the, the, the ways that um, uh, the hashtags culture mile and Smithfield market have been used. But before I do this, I want to briefly explain the physicality of Smithfield market and I'll do this really quickly. I know people are getting probably tired. But it's really important if you look here at the bottom, I showed you the pictures of the area. It's a messy area, a lot of different architecture, but it's also very lively. It's a 24 hour um, living space, much more than any other place in London because of this meat market there, which if you look at these um, weekday arrows at the bottom, the meat market opens basically from 11 o'clock at night till seven in the morning. So there's a lot of activity at night. And in the daytime, you have the typical London mixture of city workers with the suits, but also creative architects, designers, um, then clubbers, you know, people going to pubs, etc. So it's a constantly yeah, living, lively space which um, as you probably, in Italy, it's very common before COVID, but in London, it's not that co common that there's something, you know, constantly going on. 
Um, so it's a very lively space. It has a really strong identity and um, it's the juxtaposition of diverse sensory and temporal experiences, which creates a unique place identity in the Smithfield area, which people really care about. And there's this quote I, I like using where somebody describes it as it has a, a bite to it. It is a, a bit of grit, a bit of edge, a bit trendy here and there. This place is alive at 3 a.m. in the morning. You've got weird little cocktail bars around the corner underground. There's the market just around the corner. It's all this mash of it just feels it's got a little edge to it, which is really interesting. So all the people we interviewed, about 300, really wanted to keep this character before the regeneration. Yeah, this mix of activities, a bit of dirt, a bit of mixture, real urban life. Um, however, you know, by no means all the people, um, all of the people doing these different things in Smithfield will be posting about them about so on social media, but some will be. And uh, so too with some of the visitors to the Culture Mile events and activities. So let's look at the differences then. So what we did is we um, really thought of, of Instagram as part, being part of our urban imaginary that city inhabitants have. And we basically looked at all the posts ever posted for hashtag Culture Mile and for hashtag Smithfield Market. And I didn't do it, somebody who knows how to do it. Um, they created um, these kind of um, different visual stories of each area. And if you look at it, the images, the, the size of the images represents how often this image was posted. Through, um, we did that through some software that I don't know much about, but the person did. So you can really, it's um, its almost like an image cloud. You can tell which things were posted more by the size of um, the, the images that I'm showing you here. And both hashtags present completely different visual stories of the same area. Don't, yeah, remember it's the same area, just one with a branding name, the culture mile, and then one with its original name, Smithfield Market. Um, and the, like I said, the size of the image reflects the image dominance in our sample. So both hashtags refer to stagings of the same urban environment, but they focus on different um, things. So the Culture Mile hashtag all contains events, street art or cultural events related to the Culture Mile. Indeed, all the photographs of Smithy Market that appear with the Culture Mile hashtag are of events held in the market building. As the Culture Mile market team intended, this creates a temporary sense of place built from intensely experienced moments rather than everyday life routines. Yeah, the Culture Mile, if you look at the left, it's all staged events. It is what they created. The sense of drama and excitement that the Culture Mile project wants to generate parallels the edgy bus that many users of the Smithfield market describe, and both generate drama from temporary moments of juxtaposition. However, if you look at the Smithfield market images, in contrast, they are heavily focused on the materialities of the urban environment, of what's physically there, the food, the meat, the architecture, the buildings. People appear much more rarely. Looking more carefully at the Instagram images of Smithfield Market also suggests a kind of intensity, but this time much more a visual and spatial one, so not a temporal. Photographs are carefully framed, cropped and enhanced using Instagram's editing tools to create a very specific visual aesthetic. So let me conclude then. And here you can see another example how different um, they are. Yeah. So my conclusions. Let me briefly draw some conclusions. Um, we 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 can see he, uh, that uh, one of the way in which Instagram is recalibrating lived urban experiences is by attuning our realms of urban perception towards dramatic aesthetic moments snapping a performance, pausing on something gorgeous to your um, to eat and put it on your Insta feed, or crafting for hours um, the perfect Insta post. Such moments are staged, 
time limited and exciting and they feel like that whether we are urban um, we are urban branding managers or tourists on a day out everything is really exciting urban spaces are designed and intensified to feel like exceptional interventions into everyday experiences in time and space in particular, I have highlighted how there is a tendency to design and curate the physical environment and cultural activities increasingly now with the Instagram ability in mind. So the physicality, the argument in the book that we're making is that the physicality of the city is changing. Governments are thinking, how will this look on Instagram, on social media? They're not thinking about welfare issues or local problems that much, but increasingly it's how will it look you know, on social media. This encourages a dramatic urban aesthetic. It is dramatic because it's staged with different elements easily converted into Instagram posts and the Instagram user entrained in the scene by the desire to post. It is also dramatic because what is posted is often sensorially intense and a time limited experience. It is an exceptional event or sensory encounter, perhaps a temporary art installation which interrupts the everyday life. And it is not surprising that urban branding for regeneration project needs to happen in advance or that it is future oriented, of course. But what is new um, is that this branding and placemaking operates in the age of social media as this kind of distributed practice between destination marketing organizations and the city inhabitants or users. The everyday uses and effects of social media platforms like Instagram in that sense converge with the culture marketing strategy. Instagram also invites a staged, costumed and intensified version of everyday lived experience. And while the hashtag culture mile Instagram post tended to picture art and music, Smithfield um, hashtag Smithfield market posts were of food and striking architecture. In both cases, though, the lift aspect of urban space was dramatized. And this dramatic new urban aesthetic, don't forget, you know, is mediated um, as it is by the biggest social media platform. And this becomes increasingly pervasive. So corporations now not only have the power um, to really um, um, man uh, or, or to to inform how cities uh, develop, but increasingly um, they also we argue have the power to um, really um, tell our bodies and inform our bodies how we perceive and how we are tuned to the urban and the urban experience. And the last um, picture here is of the whole ex you know um, art. Um, trail of what are you going to um, meet if you turn around this corner, you know, this kind of art, public art um, installation that they did for the culture mile, which I think really explains, you know, how so um, Instagram has become the key mediation through which we should be experiencing this area of, of London. So I'll finish, I'll stop with that. And I look forward to your questions, comments, thoughts. We're still learning. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. A virtual applause to you. Um, and a wonderful presentation. Maybe uh, we could have like a three minutes pose. What do you think about it? And uh, we yeah. will start yeah. again with questions and comments at 10 past 10. So that's three yeah, minutes. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to make a quick coffee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, to the platform, to the classroom, <laughs> the virtual mm -hmm. classroom. Um, so, a wonderful presentation because it was exactly about the uh, construction of chronotopes in the era of uh, social networks and how new uh, social networks, uh, relatively new social networks like um, Facebook or Instagram, are used to um, construct a, a sense of place and also to uh, build a aura of seduction, seductiveness you know, around certain certain places. And uh, we've seen also that um, uh, this construction involves uh, bodies too, uh, the bodies of uh, photographers themselves, uh, the bodies of other people within, the bodies of the, of the general public. 
Um, so it's, it's very interesting to uh, take photographs of our cities without people now. And, uh, we can immediately uh, realize how that Instagram effect is very difficult to construct where um, there are no people around. Uh, visiting Paris, it has always been a dream to see the Louvre without people, but now that you can actually see the Louvre without people, this is pretty scary. So, uh, but I give the floor to Elsa or, or Christina and uh, to continue the discussion. Uh, thanks, um, Professor Leon. In fact, uh, what I was uh, thinking while uh, Monica was uh, presenting is the fact that uh, talks about cities and urban life uh, are very needed now in that moment. And at the same time, also, they sound uh, uh, awkward in terms of, uh, you know, uh, that project about the um, um, the rebranding of of an area uh, by showing the uh, image of people that um, leave that area are now sound uh, to us, uh, you know, very very significant because uh, it's a moment that we we are all called both a mutation and. A uh, urban expert and expert in, in the sociology of city. We are all called to think about uh, what will be the city and the urban life in the in the near future. So I think that uh, uh, work uh, as as yours, Monica, really uh, uh, laid the foundation for rethinking what is uh, uh, what which kind of city in 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 a way we want if we want uh, you know the city of corporation the city of consumption of you really want um a city that is uh, um also for uh, uh for the citizens so uh another uh, random thought that uh, uh came to my mind while you were talking was about this uh, very interesting idea of uh, dramatization of uh, urban life and why it's so significant to us because um, this um, this operation entails the attribution of uh, the, in, of facial characters to the city the excitement that uh, the uh, city marketers uh, want to transfer uh can uh, is uh, is uh, is an attribution that uh, is normally um about the face the face is the driver of emotion is the driver of excitement so i found it very interesting the idea of uh, talk in terms of dramatization of uh, of urban life and, and especially with reference to uh, the action of social media so in reference to that of course came to my mind the project that you you yourself mentioned about from Lev Manovic about Selfie City that sees uh, the visualization of this excitement of the city by recollecting um, the self-portrait in uh, uh, the selfies in five cities and, and create different kind of partner by showing different picture of, uh, of the city. So, um well my 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 question my observation was about um if uh, well if weather is uh, um yeah because just uh, a little contextualization we had the previous talk uh, um in this seminar and uh, um through this talk we uh, would try to understand uh, if uh, you know the, the question was about the face of the city has the city as a face? Is the face of the city its identity? How we can capture the identity? And of course, um, by you know the operation of uh, marketers or policymakers to um, try to catch the the face of the city through the uh, Instagram images of the city probably as as you show in in your in your study probably is the reductive right because of course uh, the idea of excitement the idea of uh, the vibrance of the city is not just you know because 
uh, then um, and it's very uh, present now with, with the pandemics basically those spaces now are empty there is no excitement so it's very yeah we, we can think that it's very reductive to try to catch that feeling through 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 the image that you know user are uh, in used to 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 upload so my my observation is whether we can um, talk in terms of maybe a, a biopolitics of space in the same way we can talk about biopolitics of of face yesterday we 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 were reflecting about that uh, that uh, concept. So, do you think that uh, those operations uh, have some or can induce some biopolitics of space through, you know, through this uh, uh, attempt to catch the the life of the city? That, of course, is something that exceeds. Uh, and uh, so, in a parallel way, that uh, happened to uh, to the face. Um, yeah, um, well, I've got quite a few ideas um, listening um, to you now, but um, I think the, the first important thing is to say is that the main audience for Instagram is between 18 and 35 year olds. Um, so that already is, you know, narrowing down who engages with Instagram and these branding marketeer experts are very conscious of that. They want the young, trendy audience. And of course, the question in, in our book, in the broader discussion is who is excluded in this dramatization? You know, what isn't included? Who, be, who doesn't become part of the new city? And then, um, like you say, COVID has thrown it all up in the air. I don't know if this project will happen now anymore. You know, everything, the funding, everything is, um, yeah, and not, it's an, an unknown um, criteria at the moment. Will tourism come back in the way it did even to Italy, Spain or, or, or Britain? No idea. Um, I don't know either. And I'm really always, uh, I don't know, I've been very impressed, not impressed in a negative way, to be really honest, um, how quickly academics have written about post-COVID when we're still in the middle of it. And there's so many unknowns um, that I don't know, it all seems again fabulation, <laughs> like I think we need to sit down and think what's happening carefully and assess the future quite carefully. I don't know, I think it's too early to to write, you know, papers or about, I mean, I've, I've, I didn't want to do that at all. I, I need time to really think what's, uh, you know, how the city is being reconfigured and how our relationship, I mean, the, the interesting thing about talking with you and about the face, it really made me think about the interface and how our bodies, including the face, are the interface through which we connect, you know, to our surroundings and to the city. So as much as you said at the beginning when you introduced me that in public spaces, you know, Goffman, et cetera, of course, wrote about how we look at each other similar as well and, and we read each other's faces. Our bodies and our faces with our organs are also the way in which we perceive, evaluate and judge, you know, the, the, the surrounding and in this case, the, the city. And I've been quite interested in how positive people have talked about COVID and their experiences in terms that like uh, Massimo, I just caught the end of, of what he was saying, you know, the Louvre without tourists, finally, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that people are rediscovering their city, um, you know, in, in their, in their urban, in their urban materiality and in their, you know, in their real without, you know, too many people around. And I think that's really something we should also think about that maybe the, the infrastructure of tourism and, and capitalism created a, dis a con complete disconnection. I mean, I don't know about you, but most people in London don't go into London anymore to Oxford Circus. You know, because it was too crowded, too many tourists, etc. Or Buckingham. It's in the same with the Ramblas. You know, it, you know, Venice is a classic example. So maybe, you know, like you say, there's some ways now to rethink 
how we can create a more sustainable city that is there for locals as much as for a global audience. And for me, then it comes back to this interface question. How are our attachments produced through what we encounter? And, and how is that mediated? Um, and I think that the sense of place or, or attachments to place are not just temporal. I think you can care also about a place if you're a tourist. I've been very critical of the anti-tourist discourses, especially in Barcelona, because I think people come because they care as well. Not everybody, but you know, a lot of people. So maybe it's also a way of redefining you know, who who is allowed to have a voice, um, you know, and to express, you know, politics of identity in cities, etc. From migrants to tourists to residents to, you know, everyone and think more in a, in a, in a broader space, a, th a way. So biopolitics of space, I completely agree. But I almost want to throw it back. How can we connect that with the facial and the embodied? Like I think the biopolitics of space needs to take into account the body as a central element. And to think about, you know, what that interaction interface actually does. And then how digital devices are almost trying to emulate what is missing in the face-to-face -face interaction in, through different means, whether it's through the filters. You know, the, the filters in Instagram are there to evoke emotions. And I didn't know until I researched it, but the original filter names are place names in California. So they used place names to evoke certain sensations through the filters which again made me think body, place, you know, how is it all connected? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave it at the moment at that. What, what do you think? Or any of, of the people here? There's so many and I want to see more faces. <laughs> uh, I think there is a question uh, yes. from Daria. Uh, mm -hmm. Daria, you can either like uh, make your voice heard or, or make your face seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not scaring funny. anyone with my appearance. No, that um, isn't. <laughs> connecting. Um, I would like uh, to connect to the previous uh, question because it's very interesting. And uh, I know that, um, so my basically uh, questions relate to uh, what our locals think about this initiative, because I know, for example, in Florence or even in Bologna, for example, which is not so tourist place in Italy, locals are really trying to avoid tourist uh, passaways, so to say, and they prefer to tourists uh, following their paths and uh, having their own hidden gems to, without tourists to enjoy their lives. And um, uh, I believe that for your project, locals can play significant role also because they are there at these places every day and their posts on social media, social networks obviously will influence uh, even the algorithm of Instagram to show more content on this topic. So the question is, um, uh, what other locals think about this because tourists themselves keen to change somehow the meaning of the environment for example um i think the most uh, crucial and somehow ridiculous uh, uh, would be uh, talking about the holocaust monument in berlin which was uh, somehow appropriated by tourists uh, doing different acrobatic <laughs> performances in front of this um, uh, very important monument for um, uh, european history and um, Czech artists took these pictures from Instagram where people smiling and doing acrobatic postures in front of this monument and uh, basically photoshopped uh, the real meaning of the monument so the dead people with the <laughs> happy young students doing this. Um, um, yeah, uh, because obviously uh, we know that um, social media somehow provoke people to the rather positive emotions. People don't post crying pictures or sad pictures on social media. And indeed, social media initially had on the like button, 
only later Facebook, for example, start to have its like button or other reaction button. Still, Instagram, for example, only has like button. So it's first uh, your positive reaction. And uh, it's um, um, confirmed with statistics that people are more uh, engaging with the positive post than with the posts uh, <laughs> which uh, have certain criticism or negative opinion on something. And uh, here probably comes second question is related to the algorithm itself. Do you consider algorithm of Instagram, which obviously influence on what kind of posts uh, pop up first? Because uh, uh, until several years ago, the main um, um, idea of Instagram recommendation algorithm was to show the recent pictures. So for example, with your project, if I go uh, to the market and do several pictures, they would appear first. But uh, today it's a combination between most popular uh, posts and recent posts. So uh, my post will pop up uh, on the top only if uh, I'm a certain type of influencer and there are many people liking, commenting and sharing this post. So like these two questions, <laughs> um, sorry, if they are probably complex. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. They're, they're brilliant, Daria. Thank you very much. Um, so what do locals think about the the initiative? I mean, we couldn't tell from the hashtags whether we were looking at locals or tourists. We didn't do, I mean, we did geolocation for the post, but you can't tell where the person is from by the name, especially, you know, in a multicultural city. Um, or, or, I mean, we all have become multicultural, but, you know, in a very mixed city. So, so, um, well, we did, um, I mean, I did on the ground research about the redevelopment and there are a lot of tensions, of course, the market workers don't want to leave the meat market. They think that the cultural regeneration will mean that they leave, which will mean that the, you know, the, the interesting identity of the area will become like another borough market or uh, I don't know what other market is nearby, but, you know, a commercial, a co corporate market. At the moment, it is, you know, very much um, working class East End London. And the owners of the market stores are, are London, white, mainly white Londoners. Although, interestingly, working in the in the meat market shops are mainly Europeans, um, you know, cutting the meat because they can't find British workers who know how to cut meat properly. So there are all kind of interesting national politics going on there as well. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of tensions, and from from um, yeah the the study on the ground, um, people don't want the area to change through the regeneration. The locals and the locals are not residents because there are not many people living there because it's the financial city of London. You know, but but then I argued in a different paper that even the financial city people, etc., don't want the area to change, and they have as much an attachment to place as anyone who lived there for thirty years. And that's why I found interesting the attachments of place. I think cannot be thought of anymore as I've been born here, and therefore I've got a bigger right for feeling this is my home than a visitor, etc. Because the visitors, the workers, felt. You know, very strongly that they wanted this, you know, authentic, you know, identity to be to stay and no transformation of it. So, so that happened, you know, on, on the ground. And now, as I said, everything is still and they don't know what will happen um, next with the whole development. Um, and then, um, in, thank you for the Holocaust Memorial. I didn't know about what happened there. I mean, I've been there, but I didn't know this um, Instagram um, um, thing that happened. So I, I will look that up. Um, and then with the algorithms of Instagram, yeah, um, we, we haven't looked at algorithms per se. I mean, there's some excellent work, as you probably know, on um, race and algorithms. Um, Sanjay Sharma, a colleague of mine, works on this, on Black Twitter, et cetera, but also looking at algorithms. In this. But um, yeah, um, we, we need to think about it more, to be honest. We, in the book, we've only really looked at the visual images and we haven't thought and written about the algorithms that much. Uh, we, we only analyze the actual images rather than, you know, how the algorithms um, 
you know make one the, the uses of of the in, of the instagram feed to be really honest but i think it'd be a brilliant study to do so i've made some notes but um it, it is yeah um what i find interesting is that instagram is changing so quickly because even as we were writing the book, we started in 2017, like, you know, and that's probably why we didn't take it into account because we've been writing, you know, Instagram has changed the way it works so much again. And it's become now with the advertising, et cetera, a, a real branding platform. It wasn't when we first started looking at it, but now, you know, it, it is a complete marketing and branding platform which we might mention in the postscript. So you're giving me an idea, <laughs> Daria, thank you. What are your thoughts on it? Um, well, it's uh, very close to the topic I'm studying. And uh, well, you are right. It's changing so fast that <laughs> it provokes so many thoughts and so many ideas that probably like, I'm not ready to conclude on anything now. Um, but uh, indeed, um, I guess there is a lot of influence, and I believe that um, uh, once was expression that who owes information of the world, and uh, it's a bit uh, old <laughs> expression, but uh, I guess we can see it with social media today because uh, you may be the most brilliant uh, uh, poster of Instagram and doing the most brilliant pictures, but if uh, algorithm doesn't uh, make you visible uh, you basically not existing and the same with um, for example uh, foursquare where people leave their reviews on different places they visit so if you're not popping up in the chart you basically do not exist and people um, don't really have uh, uh, at least my generation for example and younger uh, so we start to lose this difference between social media as a type of a game and uh, like equal to reality. So many people think that whatever is on social media is uh, the way it exists in the real world, which obviously not. It's very interesting phenomenon. So I think uh, it's very okay. interesting to research it. I mean, what I find interesting, and I don't know about cosmetic surgery and all of that, but in, in terms of cities, is that social media is increasingly determining what cities look like. That That's why I find a bit, you know, scary and new that urban planning is thinking, you know, first, what, you know, what do we need to look like before we build? <laughs> And then, of course, with CGI's computer generated images, uh, a technology that comes from Hollywood, you know, Hollywood studios. Now, architects use that technology as well to create the future visions, scenarios of what buildings will look like, feel like. So there's a real interpenetration between, like you said, I don't think we can make differences between social media and reality increasingly they both become like Munster says you know double embodiment like you become entrained in you're living in both spaces more and more and I wonder I mean it'd be interesting to hear I'm, I'm sure you know your project the uh, face facets projects looking at it what, what happens there for two to faces and we know that women especially but also men are trying to look like you know avatars etc <laughs> really um i think it's perverse but it's my personal opinion <laughs> <laughs> well whatever what was happening um I, I, what we think we might we might be happening is that uh, probably the there is sort of a reversal of the balance between uh, let's say the biological traditional physical setting of the face and yeah. its digital counterpart meaning that uh, now you actually want your face to resemble uh, its digital counterpart, and which is probably something that is happening to CV as well. So uh, the the representation, the digital representation with its filters, standards, formats, uh, many of them are actually kind of unconscious, or at least they're not explicit. They uh, tell you how you should <laughs> look or prepare yourself for um digitally uh being represented so uh probably it, it is this reversal that is a little bit disquieting because uh uh non uh, digital natives so like myself too would probably think the opposite that uh 
they somehow have to manipulate the digital representation so that uh, it correctly represents a pre-existing reality. But now it's more, I have to prepare the pre-existing reality so that it shows well in the digital representation. And that adds a lot of staging uh, um, character to the, to the picture, of course, or to the digital representation in general. And, and, and what so is... We, what is the difference, would you say, between that and in the 1950s or 60s looking at Hollywood pictures? Like, what is the, like, I'm, I'm still thinking through what the specific, the specificity of the digital is. Yeah, well, we've always tried to emulate Hollywood stars, etc. on, you know, the, the visuality and the optics of these people. So, yeah, it's a. Uh... Well, I, it's, it's a good point, but uh, definitely the fact that it's so, um, uh, the, the technological advancement, which is also related to the market, has uh, uh, led to the situation in which the technology that is needed to represent yourself or your environment is, is very small, it's very light, you can carry it with you all the time. Um, and there is um, a, also a change in quality. I mean, there, there's basically no limits in the amount of uh, digital representations that you can take every every day. So uh, this, these two elements combined with other element, elements uh, introduced a novelty that uh, your entire day now can be actually Instagrammed. And, and if you are an influencer, this is uh, this is what you do. So I. Uh, I, I like taking picture. I, I I I liked. I I used to like taking pictures of uh, of of uh, dishes, elaborate dishes in restaurants uh, where I would go, especially vegan restaurants, you know, sort of propaganda. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I've realized that people who are much younger than me, they they take videos of what they cook or, or while they are cooking. So that that would never occur to me. You know, to for me to me the mobile phone is something that is precious and should be kept uh, far away from the kitchen. From the so uh, so there is this omnipresence of the mm. of the uh, digital device that I think changes a little bit. You know, in relation to to the past, it's less maybe it's more a quantity uh, change than a quality, but it's a quantity that brings about also quality change. So. Your entire life is uh, somehow on stage, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, just one way of answering the question. Um, I don't know yeah, whether there are other comments or questions. Sono altre domande, altri commenti, anche in italiano. Diciamo volentieri, non c'è nessun problema. Yeah. I was also thinking about. Sorry, Elsa, go ahead. No, 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 no problem. No, regarding just uh, uh, those last uh, thoughts, uh, uh, I was thinking about the uh, urgency of uh, of the platform in itself, yeah. what is called uh, platform capitalism that's uh, uh, either applied to a uh, body or to spaces. So uh, the, the fact that uh, there is a creation of, uh, of uh, new kind of relationship through the uh, intermediation of the platform itself, uh, whatever is uh, uh, Instagram or um, Airbnb or other kind of, uh, um, of platform that uh, uh, mediated into um, relationship between uh, between user and uh, labor or spaces or relationships. So, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I think that's, uh, this is a, a point that, uh, uh, your project, for example, takes in consideration the fact that, uh, the, the agency of this, uh, intermediation that produce, uh, uh very meaningful, uh, effects either on phase on either on, on city. And, uh, for example, uh, in relation to, to the process of, uh, beautification of city, that uh, was a concept that was very, um, yeah, very popular, uh, when, when the presence of social media, um, was not so, uh, relevant. So there was like a, such a critical mass towards the process of, uh, uh the fact of city, uh, need to be, uh, uh yeah need to be renewed 
And so now there is not just uh, these process, but also these process are always intermediation with the image of city that is mediated by the platform itself. So I think that is uh, obviously as as you know as uh, we 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 were discussing before an element that uh, is more and more uh, um, relevant. So just as a short comment, I think. We have, uh, yeah, we have some a uh, comment in the chat about. Uh, so Daria was uh, suggesting as uh, uh, a project. Oh yeah, yeah, the, the yeah the selfie, um, selfie in Holocaust project in the chat, and uh, that's yeah. This is an important. Uh, yeah, reference that of course has uh, much to do what we were talking. So I don't know if there are other comments from from uh, Yeah, either Italian. Have, yeah, uh, Christina. I just have a, a um, a little comment to do, if I may, because I was thinking about uh, um, the agency of the platform and how this agency remediate cities, faces, bodies. And um, it reminds me of um, of an investigation made made by some colleagues in Porto in uh, sorry in Brazil um, about the um, Instagramization of female face. So how the, the platform is working, how the platform is capable of having an effect. Uh, not only in the visualization of the face, but finally in the face itself uh, uh, through surgeries and uh, any kind of physically bodily modification. So I thought that in that case, we can think about a, a mimetic vocation of the platform. And I was wondering uh, if which, which, which kind of vocation we can think about this uh, dramatization that you are uh, um, working on about the city. If it is possible to still think that there is a, a pulsion, you know, like a, a necessity to reproduce, to, to reproduce the, um, the mediatized city. So, which, and this would be the question: Which which, which would, would would be the aesthetic, the the, the the vocation? Because I think it's not that mimetic, but it, yes, it's getting to a mimetical way, but it's also dramatized, as you as you shown. So, just a. a, a a suggestion, maybe, or a question. I don't what know. What do you but... mean with vocation? I was thinking like this, for example, this phenomenon of uh, uh, social dysmorphia. No, so the the um, inflection that uh, the aesthetics of the face is circulating in Instagram can have on. Um, on people, so the vocation in this sense maybe is not the perfect uh, uh, word in English, and I apologize for my no, no, poor no. English. But I was thinking about this idea of a, a mimetic pulsion that works uh, concerning the faces, and uh, I was wondering uh, which other pulsion we can find, we can look for the cities. I mean, what I mean, let me get it right because it's not your English. I think it's more that you took from a semiotic, you know, <laughs> perspective. And I, I, I know semiotics a little bit. I studied it, of course, as part of my degree, but I'm not a semiotician, so I don't have the same vocabulary. But what we, um, I don't know if I, I hope to answer your question. What, what we did in the book, the, the dramatic is just one aspect of the urban aesthetic. And our argument in the book is that every place will have its own different aesthetic and that you always need to analyze each place in terms of bodies, the digital, the specific digital technology you study and the specific co urban context. And there will be lots of different urban aesthetics emerging. So we have three case studies. Mm. 
Um, and one is um, CGIs in Qatar. And there we argue that the aesthetic is an aesthetic of glow. Of, of you know, the, the CGIs are all about the glowing features of the city, etc. My Instagram chapter argues the dramatic. And then um, um, Gillian wrote a chapter she had a project on smart cities so she looked at smart apps at apps for the smart city up here yeah, on the phone and she argues there that the aesthetic in um uh, in uh, smart smart city apps is flow you know mm -hmm. the sensation of constantly flowing through so so we have very specific you know three different forms and and we say in the book very clearly and and it was really uh, it's our aim to say this is just a starting point. We have chosen our that we know our three case studies. There's so many more. And if you know, if you look, I don't know, I'm now imagining at another digital technology in in another city in Brazil or some a different urban aesthetic will emerge. Mm. And different types of power relations. And that's what we try to do in each case study and in the book to really you know, just look at our three as a starting point and the specific power relations that emerge from it and say, please take this book. This is a theoretical tool almost now. And, and we created a theoretical framework in the book where people can then use this to analyze, you know, how the urban is transforming in very different scenarios, settings, and they come up with a new words and new definitions and new mimetic vocations. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that answers it, Christina. It did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, in fact, when uh, Christina was uh, asking the question, the idea of uh, the aesthetics of smart city came to my mind because it's like the mimetic idea of uh, of a high um technology uh plays so has uh, high technology um high technology skilled uh need to be the citizen for example and so when you mention you know the the qatar glowing and uh, so it's it's and there is an idea of mirroring uh, uh the the filter of a, a, an instagram filter of another app filter uh that, that the city is uh, is uh, doing the same with the you know the and all of them are kind of ideology of uh, space and ideology of bodies such as uh, uh well the other one can be like the green city or the uh that is, yeah, in a way, it's very mimetic, and the green is is a clear example of like to imitate a color of nature, mm. to um, to entail a, an ideology of uh, of and a politics of of city, because also all the things related to uh, sustainability, of course, uh, have a, a politics behind. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that this is. Um, that's why I was excited when I looked up um, Professor um, 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 Massimo's um, Leone's um, ERC grant that aesthetics is so central because a lot most projects, you know, are not looking um, at aesthetics both as visual but also sensorial and the power relations behind it. So much on platform urbanism is just about well, not not just it's important about capitalism and you know, infrastructure, which is good, we need to research it. But I think the power relations are much more pervasive through experience. And I think experience is such a central word for me and in my work. And I think it's been neglected too long in the social sciences, how power and experience work together, you know. So I, you know, I, I think it's really exciting that you have the, doing this project yeah thank you thank you very much and uh and your your, your own research and uh and uh sweetness uh, to the your own lecture is, is absolutely fundamental for, for our purposes as well 
Um, I think uh, in the future we'll we'll have to face the the same issue, both uh, as regards the represent digital representation of the face and the digital representation of space. So many of our considerations are still based on the fact that we can still more or less tell the difference between a, a, an experience, a digital representation of an experience of the real and a digital representation that is just a digital representation. You know, the new iPhone, I think it's iPhone 12 Pro, has a spectacular system for extracting bodies from a um, digital image and replacing them into a completely different uh, scenario, a completely different setting. Um, uh, it's something that we, we are experiencing these months with Zoom or other platforms. You know, we, we can choose some backgrounds for our um, uh, web meetings. We can still the different, tell the difference between what is a real background and what is a digitally created background. But this is just a technical problem. I, I mean, I don't know uh, until when we'll be able through our simple like um, um, site, human site, to tell the difference. So when we won't be able to tell the difference anymore, I wonder what the meaning of space and urban space will be in relation to social networks. Now you won't actually have to be uh, or, or uh, having been there to tell realistically that you were there. Um, uh, something will probably uh, switch. Um, I mean, still the fact of being surrounded by a certain space will be different, you know, like uh, increase, uh, virtual reality gives a very poor feeling of atmospheres and space and so on and so forth. But as regards the digital narration of it, it will be very difficult to distinguish between, let's say, um, digital representations of experience and digital representation of a stereotype, digital stereotype of experience in a way. I don't know what you think about it, Monica. Well, I, as you were talking, I had the Matrix in my head, the film, the Matrix, <laughs> yeah. but also, you know, the old philosophers, what is real, what isn't, you know, the the, yeah. the question, but also Baudrillard, people, the classics, um, you know, that already set some of these questions, of course, years ago. Um, I think it's quite, I don't know, I'm like you, um, yeah, older, so I, I'm not that comfortable in the digital and and I guess my research has always been about uh, the physicality of the sensorial because I really love it, but believe in it. And and I one of my PhD directors was somebody called Didi Bowden, who worked with Harvey Mollock, um, American professor, on the importance of proximity, and that despite all the digital you know innovations, people long to be face to face and in physical proximity with each other. Even the big corporations, um, they argued, for example, you know, like like this kind of notion that, that um, it matters to be together in the city of London or in a creative class because people still want to go for lunch together and discuss and that's how creativity happens. I mean, I don't know how other ex people experience this, but Zoom, isn't that creative? in terms of we, if we want to do thinking work, et cetera, together, we, for some reason, I, mean, I love seeing you there now, but it isn't the same as being in a room and engaging with each other with ideas and so on. So my belief is that there will be a bounce back. And I, I really see it already in my students and I'm sure the people here will say the same. Young, young people make clear differences between my online friends and my real friends. And I'm always fascinated by that and how they also prefer. My students really want to meet me at the moment. They keep saying, Monica, can you not come into London? I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah, we can't. Yeah, but the, the physical presence is still what makes human humans creative thinking beings, I think. So I'm clinging on to this, but I think there will be, you know, it, what you say, the, the, the virtual reality will become much more elaborate um, and, you know, people will live in that realm. But I wonder, Massimo, if in the future there will be also a two-tier society 
almost that and we might see this unfortunately already with covid who can you know aff afford to travel and get a passport a vaccine passport and go and experience the real and who will have to stay at home yeah this is this is very important you know like i was thinking it exactly today because uh, today the lockdown will start in, in paris as i said yeah. at the, the beginning of my lecture and uh, I would see all these people live in Paris and yeah. um, and go to their second homes, uh, the seaside or in the countryside. So mm -hmm. in, in the end, like capital is always what guarantees a good experience, no matter yeah. what. Uh, so uh, probably this is something that we we'll have to take into into consideration uh, for our studies. But anyway, it has been a great pleasure. And uh, at least we know that for a long time, some uh census will not be digitalized so next time i hope you'll come to turin and we'll invite you to a wonderful cup of coffee and the smell <laughs> coming from the coffee that you'll be able to drink the espresso in the bar in front of the university will not be digitalized and, and not um, um and not will be for a very long time i hope so uh thank you very much for participating thank in our you. seminar and i leave the floor to Elsa and christina for the final like um, greetings. Thank you, Mas. <laughs> well, uh, once again, thanks, uh, Monica. The the wish, Massimo, uh, <laughs> or just uh, made is is more than share among uh, Christina and me too. So yeah, we're really, really looking forward to, you know, to meeting it, uh, you know, in a real city in a real public space and yeah maybe take a take a picture and post on instagram but at least uh, <laughs> at least after a real experience of uh, yeah we, we you know research as as yours really make uh, so vivid the the wish of uh, star again to to experience cities and in urban life so yeah we're really really looking forward to it uh, well, thanks, uh, uh, obviously, to uh, also to our students that uh, were very, very keen and uh, just, uh, I will, yes, just, uh, we, we have uh, other brilliant appointments uh, next week. So I also invite uh, Monica, if you have time to uh, join us uh, every Thursday and every Friday, not all of them because I think you're busy, but <laughs> we will be uh, here in this platform uh, for, with other brilliant tools that really enrich uh, our um, our reflection about the chronotopes of uh, of face. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Massimo, for hosting us, and thanks, Christina, for co-coordinating with me. And of of course, uh, thanks to Monica. I see you soon. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you Monica. very much. Thank Bye. You. Ciao. 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 Ciao.